this sounds like a parody of what an anti-woke youtuber would say in regards to disabled representation just have them not be disabled anymore jesus christ we knew that nerd erotic was incredibly uncomfortable with the idea of disabled people being in media but hell genuinely ridiculous said by somebody who has absolutely lost the plot the line was we needed someone who was male nor female but neither and both and so much more be non-binary is more than human that's not even the quote he's just made up that quote and you you can see the look on his face that he knows he's making this up he knows he's bullshitting he's lying and he knows it then we have a bunch of unit soldiers consisting of white dudes and white ladies and I think to myself, wait, this kind of thing isn't allowable anymore. But don't worry, little ones, all will make sense shortly. There is a unit soldier later on who does have a turban. I think that Bolstrek's gonna have issues with that. Imagine feeling the need to put this in a review. Oh, there's white unit soldiers, but later on, one that isn't white is gonna turn up. Imagine being unable to enjoy or even engage and watch with a piece of media without having this running through your mind. It must genuinely be quite distressing, like genuinely mentally debilitating. Later. Then Major Singh is here to keep white army dudes in line, but they tell him to get- I knew he'd do it! I knew he'd do it! Then they escape through the house of a lazy white dude, representative of- Oh my god, he's so obsessed with race! He can't perceive anything else. It's just so out in the open. They say it themselves. They're just like, yeah. Queer people, black people, disabled people shouldn't be in media. Get rid of them. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mr. Tardis and Doctor Who the Star Beast broadcast last week. I've just finished my own review of it. Patrons have got instant early access to it and on YouTube it will take a couple of days for the content ID and the copyright stuff to make its way through because I go really in depth on the review. I use the clips in order to substantiate and talk about use examples and such so it takes a little bit of time. However, the internet has been very, very busy passing out uh, their opinions on the episode of the Star Beast and I thought what we'll do is that we'll take a look at a few of the the, the more choice ones. Now, just to clarify before we get into all of this, if you dislike the Star Beast, that's fine. I thought it was okay, personally. I liked it more than I didn't like it. I had a few issues with the story, but we're not going to be looking into stuff like that today. We're going to be looking at specifically reactions that took a massive ideological issue with the Star Beast from point of principle, aka videos which I think it's safe to say were pre-written, or at least they were going to say this stuff regardless of how the actual episode turned out. The material reality of what the episode did, what the episode contained, how subjectively good or bad it was, doesn't play a factor here. Some of these are reviews done by people I've talked about in the past. Some of them are going to be brand new. Many of them have been requested by people in the Mr. Tardis Discord server. There's this one here, Doctor Who's 60th anniversary ruined by wokeness from Gate of Theories. I've never watched Gate of Theories before. It's a nice short video to get started. Let's take a look. Hello guys and welcome back to Gate of Theories and guys I was so excited for today's episode of Doctor Who. I'm just looking at their channel now and they had a video two years ago how Russell T Davis will make the Hooniverse amazing. So you know what I'm going to take this guy at his word for this. Maybe he was excited with the Star Beast but what wokeness ruined the episode? David Tennant back in the 60th anniversary special for the first episode, The Star Beast. And I thought it was going to be amazing. It was going to be like series four all over again. And then it just wasn't like, like, like it wasn't. And today we're going to go through some clips as to why I think it wasn't. And I'll give you a hint. It's because it went way too woke. Now, I don't mind adding in woke elements. I mean, the times have changed. It's now 2023. It's a very different time than it was back in 2009, 2010. It'll be interesting to know if he's able to differentiate between the subjective wokeness of a series in 2008. Series 4 had incredibly preachy, out in the open episodes about being anti-slavery, talking about the health industry, carbon emissions, all of turn left, for example. So it'll be interesting to know exactly what the issues were. And it just feels off. So let's have a look at some of these. Okay, so one of the big new things about this episode is that we find out Donna in the past 15 years has had a daughter called Rose and she is a trans kid. No issue with that. It's important to have representation. And I think it's really cool that Doctor Who is heading in this direction. 
However, Russell T Davies did not approach this in the right way, in my opinion. Now, there was one scene where he approached this really nicely, and it shows the representation, and it shows that it's important to the character, but doesn't make it their entire personality. And that's this scene. Let's have a watch. I never know. When I say she looks gorgeous. Is that right? When is it so now, I'm not going to play the full thing, because this might be copyrighted. So, it's the scene where Sylvia Noble doesn't quite know what to do with... Uh, with Rose Noble. It's simple, it's not shoehorned in, it doesn't feel forced, it feels organic, it feels like it is related to these characters from what we know of what these characters were like back in the day. It feels good. I think this is really good representation. However, then from this point onwards, it just becomes very- Okay, this is really interesting though, because this trans representation is a scene that doesn't actually involve the trans character in question. This is Sylvia and Donna talking about Rose. This isn't Rose actually being in the story, which I don't... Oh, I'm getting alarm bells here. The idea of trans representation is good if you don't show the trans character on screen. I think that this Gator Theories chap might have a massive blind spot. Very in your face, very much like this is a message that I want you to follow and I want you to hear rather than this is the story about um, aliens running around. See, when I hear that, this just sounds like standard Doctor Who operating procedure. Stories from all the way back from the origin of the show back in the 1960s to even Russell T. Davis's involvement from 2005 onwards. Like I said, there was an episode of Planet of the Ood where the Doctor and Donna basically look directly at the camera and are like, who do you think made all of your clothes? You know, you don't, you say that you don't have slaves in the UK, but who made the clothes? So what's the difference between the supposed wokeness in 2023 and the wokeness in 2008, other than you grew up and you noticed it more? Let me show you the next clip. Bearing in mind, they're dealing with an alien from out of space. They've got to be careful that Donna doesn't find out that who the Doctor is, because if this is the case, she will die. So the stakes are very high. Straight after this, there's a massive fight with guns and lasers and everything. So it's very high tension, this scene. And this is what happens. Yes, the meat. I promise I can help him get home and then you'll never see me again. You're assuming he as a pronoun. Okay. Uh that's a slight misrepresentation of the scene. It's not super high stakes. They're actively relaxing in the living room because they think that they're okay. The doctor saw the unit soldiers at several doors down and investigated on his own. And also remember, the doctor at this point does not know that the unit soldiers have been possessed by the Meep spaceship. At the end of this scene, when the unit soldiers are knocking on the door, the doctor says, oh, they're with me. They're here to help. We can get, we can use the unit soldiers and me and the Meep can go away. Look good, the soldiers, they can give us a lift. This lot are on my side. So the idea that, oh, they stopped a super high stakes scene to ask for proper pronouns, not true. Yes, sorry, good point. Are you, he, or she, or they? My chosen pronoun is the definite article. I am always the me. Oh. <laughs> like, what, what, what's the issue there? They're called the Meep. They're a genderless alien from the stars that goes by the definite article, aka the same definite article that the main character of the show for the past 60 years also uses. We've had genderless aliens since arguably the Daleks, definitely the Sensorites in 1964, but also the Sontarans, Alpha Centauri from the 1970s. This, this is just standard Doctor Who operating procedure. Or is he a she? Neither. She's an it. It's a hermaphrodite hexapod. Oh. Girl, you have two species on this planet. You have a primary and secondary reproductive cycle. It is an inefficient system. You should change it. It just feels so forced. Like, you could have said that in- You can argue that it's forced, but is it any more forced than in the 1970s? Is it any more forced than in the 1960s? Once again, what's the difference between then and now, other than you grew up? and you noticed it more. What's the psychological fallacy or whatever when you hear a word and then you all of a sudden just start hearing it and seeing it everywhere? I think that's what's happened with Gate of Theories. However, for some reason, it has to make that this new character, Rose, makes being trans their personality. And I don't think that's- That's not me. No, I am, I am a cisgender man. You can probably tell. If I were asking for pronouns in a specific setting or a specific context, that's just a basic courtesy. And what's funny though, is that in this scene, Rose was absolutely right to do this because the Meep isn't a he or a she or a they. They are the Meep. Rose was completely right here. And I don't think that's fair on trans people. And I don't think it helps them in getting out their message because it is just shoehorn. What, what do you mean the message of trans people? Trans people exist. What's the message of trans people? 
like genuine thought process. If there was a queer person, a gay person, or even a black person or another marginalized group on screen, like all of a sudden is the acknowledgement of their existence, of their marginalized group existence, is that all of a sudden a message? Like, I don't get what's being implied here. Also, when has this ever been an issue before in Doctor Who? Why are they randomly making- 1960s, 1970s, since almost the very beginning of the show. Issue now? Who really cares? The Doctor- This was even brought up in 2006 in The Impossible Planet when Rose is being served by the Ood and is like, oh, I used to do that, be a dinner lady. Oh, so not that I'm calling you a lady. Although you might be. Not that I'm calling you a lady. Although I don't know, you might be. I, it's, it's played for laughs, but that is acknowledging the redundancy of a gender binary for certain alien species, including the Meep. Who really cares? The Doctor could have easily just- <laughs> No one cared. The Doctor was like, oh, yeah, you're right. What are you, Meep? And then the Meep was like, my pronoun is the definite article. I am the Meep. And then they just move on. You're the one making the big deal out of this. Just simply called it the Meep. I don't understand why we randomly had to have this very forced in politically drived wokeness in the middle of this scene. <laughs> Asking an alien how it wants to be referred to. How is that politically charged woke? What, what is this? Do they take like a, a minute to randomly discuss this? It doesn't seem relevant to the plot. It doesn't really add anything. Why do they take a moment, literally two or three sentences, to make sure that even the audience know what to call the alien that is the subject of the story? It doesn't change the storyline. Just seems a bit useless. And then again, the scene earlier on that you called good representation with Sylvia and Donna, that didn't move the plot forward either. You can have these character moments, you can have this texture, you can have these moments that don't necessarily move the plot, but define or explain or establish character. Like, you even used this as a point in its favour earlier. Oh dear, what are the odds that this person would have an issue with a scene with a trans person in it, but was absolutely okay with the same woke ideology or whatever, but where the trans person was not present? I wonder, I wonder what the common denominator is here. And then we come to the part which I really, really dislike, and it's the reason why Donna Noble doesn't die when she ends up meeting the Doctor. Now, the concept of Donna having a child and the Metacrisis being split between them because Donna now has a child makes perfect sense. I think that's a great idea, and that is such a good way of being able to reintroduce Donna Noble and her family without having them die. Brilliant concept. I think it's perfect. They should have just ended it there. Instead, they had to make another political comment and force its way in. And, and this one really does feel forced. Here we go, watch this. Too much power for one person, but you had a child and the Metacrisis passed down a shared inheritance. There you go. That explanation, brilliant. I think that was perfect. I was so excited. I was like, oh my word, that makes so much sense. And then, here we go, the forceful part. Binary. Non-binary. Binary. Like, I will actually, hand on heart, agree with Gate of Theories here. I think that Rose was severely underwritten in the story. Ironically, my issue is kind of the opposite of Gate of Theories in that I wanted more of Rose. I wanted more of her character, and I wanted to I wanted her to be more proactive in the story. Rather than being the subject of conversations, I wanted her to be more active in it, which includes her being trans femme non-binary. It's not just that that's severely underwritten for Rose, it's her reaction to the meep when it does the heel turn. It's the soft toys that are meant to be the Metacrisis memories passing on their way through to Rose, but those toys are not present in the story earlier on. They're not even background details. They're cutaways that are later on, so it kind of cheated. Stuff like that. We agree on the same point, but I think we took different routes to get there. And then it continues at the end where we randomly get extra words added for no reason. Like there's no need for any of this to be added. It's just almost played off as a weird little joke that doesn't really land. It feels very forced this next part. Have a watch. Not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. Yeah, uh, I have a feeling we are going to actually agree on this thing. The Doctor was a woman a couple of hours ago. I think that this is meant to be just a bit of a, a light-hearted, friendly insult, kind of like how Donna Noble would constantly insult the Doctor's dress sense and being skinny all the time. But the fact that Rose is so underwritten over the course of the story does cause this to fall flat. Just seems a bit forced. What was the need? And the reason why I get so annoyed at this is because finally we have some good trans representation in Doctor Who. It's about time. However, they've decided to make Rose's entire personality that she is trans. 
Like, there is so much more to this character. I want to know about this character. I want to know their personality. Instead, all we know about them is what they do to try and help their parents and their gender. That is it. We don't know anything else about them. Uh, there's a little line at the end saying they're apparently really bad at drama. That's it. Instead, the yeah, uh, yeah. I I also agree with Gate of Theories here. Like Rose was incredibly underwritten over the course of the story. That's why I consider the Star Beast to be a bit of a compromised episode because it also has to do the Star Beast plot with the Meep and with Rose, and it also has to reunite the Doctor and Donna. And both of those sides end up suffering because they don't coalesce into a an interesting or compelling whole. But that's not so much an episode being ruined by wokeness, that's an episode being hampered by structure. The entire episode is used as a political forefront to sh shove this wokeness in people's faces. And so what, in like a 58 minute episode he played maybe about 30 seconds of clips? If 30 seconds is enough to ruin an entire hour of TV ruined by wokeness, I think that does say a little bit more about you than it does the program itself. I do think that in this case there are some legitimacies to the argument, but I do think Gate of Theories here is approaching this from a pretty skewed perspective. So let's consider this a bit of a warm-up reaction. Let's go in the recommended and see. Okay, so ignore it. You're just being gaslit. This is from the Dave Cullen show. Now for context, Dave Cullen isn't one of those ones who thinks that Doctor Who suddenly got woke and was ruined during the Jodie Whittaker era. No, he actually thinks it started happening in series 10 under Stephen Moffat, and he specifically blamed the Jews for it. So it'll be interesting to know what he thinks of the run under Russell T Davis in 2023. So I've been asked to comment on the recent Doctor Who 60th anniversary special, which I actually didn't want to do. And I mentioned this recently in my exclusive Subscribestar video on the, the change that was made to the character of Davros. Uh, I didn't want to go any further with this, but I've been asked to talk about it. Now, I'm not going to do a review of the episode uh, because that's, I think there's actually something more important here that I have to say. Uh, I thought about doing like a tongue-in-cheek sarcastic review, but instead I'm going to talk about something else. And and so, as we know, Doctor Who has, has been woke for a few years now. Uh, but I think even as far back as, you know, when Captain Jack was on the show in the first Russell T. Davis era, some, looking back, like some of the behavior was inappropriate, in my opinion. So, so some of the things that the, that, that character was doing. Uh, but Doctor Who has gone... It's become more progressive and agenda driven, especially in the latter part of the Stephen Moffat era and especially in the Chris Chibnall era. Yeah, like I said, he thinks that uh, Doctor Who started going woke towards the end of the Moffat era. He specifically cited the Jews for it in a video uh, a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if he thinks that now, but that's what he said at the time. Uh, with the first female doctor. So I cannot understand why there's a very, very significant and vocal percentage of the Doctor Who fan base who, let's just say, they seem to care more for Doctor Who's political messaging than the quality of the stories. At least it appears that way. The special also includes a new character, a 15-year-old trans character called Rose. The Doctor is also lectured about correct usage of pronouns. This is a complete misrepresentation of the scene. He is not lectured, and it even turns out that, yes, the Meep does go by its own definitive article term, aka the same as the main character of the show. Isn't it intensely ironic that the title of this video, ignore it, you're being gaslit, and the first actual supposed point from the episode two minutes into the video is just an outright lie? He mentioned earlier that there are people who are watching Doctor Who and only judging it through an ideological or political lens, but honestly, but when you see these video titles, you know, Doctor Who ruined by wokeness, get slammed by fans for boring them with woke agenda, and people like Clownfish TV and Nerdrotic who talk nothing except for the politics of the shows that they're talking about, this seems a lot like projection. For the most part, Doctor Who fans do just want the fun blue box show, but it's these folks who are dragging the politics into it. And this has been happening for several years now, demonstrably. And there's even a scene where Rose and Donna say the following to the doctor. Okay, so this is the dialogue. Yes, we know. We know everything, thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore because you'd have understood. We got all that power, but there is a way to get rid of it. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. I'm not joking, that's the actual dialogue in this scene. So stunning, so brave. Now, people who see this for what it is truly know that this is yet more of the message. In fact, 
The BBC has an article criticizing the special for this kind of thing. Before we get to this bit, the term the message has basically just become a dog whistle at this point. The message is a term, is a phrase that I keep on seeing being thrown around in these reactionary circles where they're more obsessed with the message. When firstly, let's not forget that TV and media is, is specifically made by people with ideologies, with opinions who want to express that through art, through media, through entertainment and things like that. So that's just the process of making media. That's just the process of art. But also the term the message is so vague is so malleable that it becomes similar to the word woke where it basically just creates its own definition based on who's saying it and who is reading it so when dave cullen is saying that this is for the message he could honestly have said anything in that sentence and it would have been just a substantive the bbc has an article criticizing the special for this kind of thing which is incredible coming from the bbc so here's the article from the 21st of november it was written by neil armstrong and towards the end of the article, it says, And although the show has always been progressive, look at the number of stories over the decades about, for example, threats to the environment. This special is preachy, and by the end, little more than a delivery system for the message. Whenever I see the words, the message, I always think of how the critical drinker says it. The message, right? So I yeah, think... and Armstrong and the critical drinker are stupid as well for using it in this context without any sort of substantiation, without any sort of elaboration, without anything. Like, honestly, there's nothing here. Armstrong could have written anything in this sentence and it would have been just as substantial. I think that's a fair comment there. Uh, I'm sure the... It's not really a fair comment without any sort of substantiation so it had many positive aspects to it but people are focusing in particular on the portions of the episode that push the message and when i see people complain about how the episode is preachy and message driven they're getting gaslit on social media by people who really like this kind of messaging and identity politics what, what is the messaging what is the identity politics like what is it T tell us please People who feel that they need to see themselves represented in everything in pop culture. Okay, so in this case, the message is just the existence of trans people, just the existence of disabled people, the existence of mixed race people. Like, what what's being implied here? Ideas and concepts are being promoted in such TV shows that were simply unthinkable 10 years ago and that the same fan base had no interest in. But you see, the social engineering in our society has crept in and now they're crying tears of joy about all this stuff. Okay, social engineering. This is similar to what Philip Kisley said on GB News when he was saying that social engineering for children in this context is bad because black people and, and people of colour shouldn't be on TV. So I'm not sure if Dave Cullen is implying the same thing. Think of the children. There's a trans person on screen. Okay, so they've been told what they should care about. So the problem I see is this. If you're really upset with some of the themes and the treatment of the Doctor in this episode, you will be gaslit. Your concerns on social media will be fodder for the lefty lovies to laugh at you. They'll claim- We are halfway through this video and Dave has not actually said a single prescriptive statement. He's not even said what supposedly the message is. This is just nothing. This is a nothing video so far. He's not said anything. In that you're the one who's being hysterical. It's just a sci-fi TV show, bro. The Doctor is a Time Lord alien, bro. He's always been non-binary, didn't you know that? Uh, Doctor Who has always been progressive. You know that, right? You'll be labelled. I mean, even the review that you cited earlier mentioned that, you know. <laughs> Seems a little bit self-defeating, bro. <laughs> if I TV show, bro, the Doctor is a Time Lord alien, bro. He's always been non-binary, didn't you know that? Uh, Doctor Who has always been progressive, you know that, right? You'll be labelled an ist and a phobe of some kind. So the important no, it thing- it depends on what you're implying with the statement and what you say afterwards as well. There's definitely some uh, additional elements that need addressing when you make a statement like that. Doctor Who has always been progressive. Then the sentence continues. What, what do you say afterwards? For example, in Dave Cullen's case, Doctor Who has always been progressive, but dot dot dot. A few years ago, he was saying, but now it's gone woke because the Jews have taken over. And then you get labeled the racist, anti-Semitic or whatever, because it has always been progressive is half a sentence in this context. Is not to invest your energy or attention in this kind of stuff. Now, we've been, we've been calling out sort of wokeness for many years, but I think we're at a point now where there's no point. There's no point. Uh, the damage is done. 
to these franchises. So that's the reason I didn't want to make this video. And it's the reason I won't be reviewing the episode, you know, a plot breakdown or something. There's no point. If you see a dumpster fire and you identify it correctly as being a dumpster fire, there's no point arguing with people who think it's a stunning and brave work of art. Withdraw. I mean, to be fair, you're five and a half minutes in and you've not actually said anything. Your attention from this and from those people, because I honestly believe you, you've you've not even you've not even started or begun to make the argument that not only is there a dumpster fire, but that there's even a dumpster or a fire or even a metal container. This is a full video that is a virtue signaling Dave Cullen's anti woke credentials or whatever. This is all that this is. With people who think it's a stunning and brave work of art. Withdraw your attention from this and from those people because I honestly believe that the insertion of the message in shows like this Such is as? designed to provoke a divisive reaction. The fan base gets divided. One side loves the material. The other side hates it. And the side that hates it is blamed for being out of touch, backward, intolerant, and an ist and a phobe. Okay, and that's just going to frustrate you. It's going to make you feel bad. So the social engineering is designed to wreck the franchise you loved. And then when you complain about it, you're told that you're the one who has the problem. And you're the reason why there needs to be more of this stuff in the episodes. Okay? I mean, you are making an incredibly solid case for, for why that side that you dislike are 100% right. I mean, you're not presenting anything substantial. You're not presenting an actual decent counter argument against those people. You are, in this video, you are validating that perspective. That's why there needs to be more of this agenda pushed. So this is what an abusive relationship feels like. We already know how this game is played. We've seen it happen in lots of other franchises, okay? They're doubling down, and they've doubled down hard with Doctor Who, okay? So just ignore it. It's over. Doctor Who is done. Put a fork in it. It's done. All right? Don't comment on this stuff. Ignore it. I mean, it's pretty interesting. If there were actually some big substantial issues with the episode of Russ T. Davis's approach to the new era of Doctor Who or whatever, probably name them. I mean, all he's done so far is misrepresent a scene about the pronoun, and he's also complained about a tongue-in-cheek gender observation that's a little bit bungled in the episode, but amounts to two or three sentences in a 60-minute story. I mean, if the Star Beast itself was actually that bad, that's so obviously terrible, and that you're being gaslit for complaining about it, then, you know, clearly the episode has done a pretty good job. I mean, it's given Dave zero material. Don't allow it to mire you in negative energy and don't come into conflict with people who will defend it and then claim that you're the problem. Focus on making something new. And I think Thomas... Reminder, this guy did not like series 10 because he thought that the BBC had been infiltrated by Jews. Tell you what, speaking of people who thought that the BBC had been taken over by Jews, but in 2018 as opposed to 2017, let's talk about Bolstrek. Just for context before we get into this, Bolstrek is an open neo-Nazi YouTuber who thinks that series 11 of Doctor Who was a Jewish conspiracy in order to get rid of all the white people at the BBC. He gets irrationally angry almost to the point of tears whenever a black person appears on TV, and he also thinks LGBTQ plus people are illegal and groomers by default. So we're going to have a lot of fun with his Star Beast review. I wasn't going to watch this crap, but then, when all the news surrounding it seemed to reach levels of stupidity not seen since the reign of Chibs the Idiot, I decided to give it a watch, and dear God we'll was this, this crap. We start with David Tennant giving a very wooden speech, which foreshadows his overall performance as Dr. Desperation. It seems he really isn't into this. It seems Donna is having dreams. Dreams about what Doctor Who was like before it started to suck. It seems Donna is sad about <laughs> Yes, back before it was woke, you know, episodes like Planet of the Ood, Turn Left, The Good Old days when there was no politics. We're all sad, Donna. Current year is terrible. Dr. Desperation says he can't ever see Donna again, which will last about two minutes and questions why he is wearing that face again. Simple Dr. Desperation, Desperation followed by a bait and switch. And I really don't think it could be any more obvious that you really, really don't want to be here. Then we're back in London as RTD only seems to be capable of repeating what he already did almost 20 years ago, except repeating it very badly. <laughs> Just the idea of being in London? <laughs> sorry, sorry, folks. We we can't go back to this setting ever again. What? The TARDIS lands in current year, and we run into Donna and her daughter Rose, henceforth to be known as Tiddlywinks, the center of everything. Tiddlywinks makes toys. Whatever. I don't care. <sighs> With reactionary YouTube, 
They really send their best, don't they? They really send their most intellectual. They really, <laughs> they really put the smartest, most thoughtful people on a pedestal who can't actually come up with a substantive critique of a character. So just call them tiddlywinks and pretend that that's normal. Then a spaceship crashes and stuff blows up because this is RTD's version of clever writing. Just blow stuff up because the plebs are stupid. An alien lands on Earth. Like, oh, okay. Okay, Russell, you can't be in London. You can't have aliens. Does this guy even watch Doctor Who? What? Stupid. Of course, Donna missed it. G don't tell him about the Pertwee days. Don't tell him about when he was stranded on Earth. Don't. No. St <laughs> make, sure, <laughs> make sure he doesn't watch season seven. Because Donna misses everything. Because, again, remember, this is what happened before, plebs. Then Donna makes fun of Doctor Desperation. Well <laughs> He's, oh, he's really got nothing. He's, he's got absolutely nothing. For wearing a tight suit over the age of 35. But then, we don't like people over 35 around here anyway. This show was just made for the cool kids. As long as you can check all the right boxes to work for the BBC, either that or RTD considers your mommy and daddy not dirty plebs. Then we meet Donna's- D David Tennant is the doctor right now. What are you even on about? The persecution complex, the need to be victimized, the need to be the victim, the need to be the downtrodden Canadian Nazi. Folks, I found live footage of Bolstrek's house right now. Hey birdie. That's okay birdie. I'm gonna take care of you birdie. Okay? <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> you don't take care of him. He's way scared of the Jews. Then we meet Donna's husband and learn that she gave away all her money for reasons. You know, that money they won in the rigged lottery. We find out the reasons later, and they are reasons. The reasons you might expect. Now they're broke, because that must be a thing. Can't be a victim if you don't force yourself to go broke. A situation that was completely avoidable. Then we go to Boom Boom Splosion Factory and meet this lady to in a To be fair, I don't think that uh, the noble family chose conservative austerity. I'll, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. I don't think that they were able to control those material conditions, but that's just a guess on my part. Then we go to Boom Boom Splosion Factory and meet this lady in a wheelchair. We don't know who she is, but we know she won't be a villain because RTD said that kind of thing is no longer allowed in an effort to be not patronizing. Then we have a bunch of... Now, okay, to be fair to Bolstrek, he has to take this line of reasoning because when he reviewed It Takes You Away back in 2018 with the blind girl called Hannah, he just completely lost his mind and said that disabled people shouldn't even be on TV shows in the first place. So, you know, he wants to try and act indignant about the Davros thing, but he does consider disabled people to be below representation. You know, you're, you're out of sight, out of mind. You in your wheelchair, you on your crutches, you with your whatever, don't care, don't like you, you don't deserve to be on TV. Then we have a bunch of unit soldiers consistent of white dudes and white ladies and I think to myself wait this kind of thing isn't allowable anymore but don't worry little ones all will make sense shortly then in a mind-blowing attempt there is a unit soldier later on who does have a turban and I've okay I think that Bolstrek's gonna have issues with that. Imagine feeling the need to put this in a review. Oh, there's white unit soldiers, but later on, one that isn't white is gonna turn up. Like, imagine watching TV through this lens. Imagine being unable to enjoy or even engage and watch with a piece of media without having this running through your mind. It must genuinely be quite distressing, like genuinely mentally debilitating. Then in a mind-blowing attempt at subtlety, as Tiddlywinks and Donna are walking down the street, a bunch of white dudes drive by on bikes and are laughing at Tiddlywinks while calling them Jason. What is this now? Oh, RTD, you little trickster. That was as subtle as your obsession with Boom Boom Splosions as an attempt to mask your lack of creativity or even remotely being able to think of something you haven't done already. Don't you worry, Tiddlywinks. Donna's going to tell their parents and have them cancelled. Then we are reintroduced to Donna's mother. That's just an absolute nothing point. <laughs> That's, he had so little to complain about with that scene that he had to poison the well first to listen. Then in a mind-blowing attempt at subtlety... Like, no one was claiming this was subtle. Th this is just the text of the scene. It's not subtle, it's just what happens out in the open here. So, like I've said before, these are the arguments of somebody who has nothing, who has nothing going on in that brain, and most importantly knows they have nothing going on in that brain. Then we are reintroduced to Donna's mother and she's gone current year too. Donna tells her that Tiddlywinks is sad because white dudes. Donna's mom tells Tiddlywinks she's gorgeous, but then- she Because of white dudes, I don't even think we see the race of the kids on the bikes, do we? Two seconds, I'm, I'm going back through the episode to find this. Wait, Jason, you all right? I, I, the, the one in front is Caucasian. 
I can't even tell the back two. You right? But like, but like I said, imagine watching media through this lens. A genuine brain rot. She feels bad because she's worried she's being sexist for calling Tiddlywinks gorgeous. Not even introduced as a joke because jokes aren't allowed anymore. Well, unless. <laughs> but that's actually a pretty human observation. Like, like, I, I, like, she's actually got a pretty interesting and intriguing perspective here. Like, is it infantilizing? Is it sexist to, you know, maybe over the top affirm your child's gender identity? You know, it's an interesting conversation to have. Like, genuinely. Unless it's directed at white dudes, then we get to sit through a conversation. They're directed at white dudes. Come on, what does the race of the audience have to do with this? And why are you assuming the race of the audience? And then we're introduced to whatever the hell this is supposed to be as 2005 looks at the current effects department with Shane. Definitely checking those Oh, come on. I know that Bolstrek's whole shtick is that he cannot say anything positive ever, but I, even people who dislike the show kind of have to acknowledge that the Meep is a pretty impressive execution in terms of modern practical effects on a TV BBC show. But from Bolstrek's approach, if you give this inch, the Wokies will take a mile or whatever. You, he can't even say, hypothetically, that David Tennant was good in this so it was just the material that sucked i didn't really like the meep as a character but the effects are really good no negativity all the time all the time always 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 because that is part of the point he is overcompensating for so much the effects department aren't we russell non-gender descript furry thing is being hunted by monsters so see e <laughs> even bolstrek is siding with the idea that you shouldn't assume he is a pronoun on this thing bolstrek you fucking ally White dudes, then we meet up with the bug-eyed things, and I think, dear god, they're hunting non-gender descript furry thing. Good luck, bug-eyed dudes. Those costumes don't seem to move very well. Then Dr. Desperation, who That's looks true. bored out of his mind, meets up with Wheelchair Lady, and she is the most awesomest scientific advisor ever. Do he yeah, he here's the thing, though. Very similar to what he did with Thaddeus Graham in Flux, because he was just absolutely fucking fuming that a non-white person was on screen, that he dehumanized her to the extent that he wouldn't even say the character's name. He does not consider disabled people to be human, therefore she's just wheelchair lady. Does not consider trans people to be human, therefore she's tiddlywinks or whatever. But it just demonstrates that he just does not think that these people are human. Like I mentioned earlier, he doesn't even think that disabled people should be represented, should be in media, should be on television. So of course the natural extension of that is, well they're subhuman. And this is just a further extension of that. He thinks disabled people are subhuman. Then wheelchair lady tells Dr. Desperation to go away because she can handle things better than him because she's the bestest of all that's not what happens in the scene but you know when are we going to start trying to tell the truth you know we're, we're halfway through this review and like i wasn't expecting you to start being honest now then the white soldier dude apologizes for the stairs and wheelchair lady gets pissy then the unit white dude that's the literal opposite of what happens in the scene this is something i really want to emphasize for people who watch these anti-woke reviews or whatever they will lie to your fucking face about the objective contents of the episode itself it doesn't matter if you disliked the episode if you thought it was woke or whatever if you're whatever the actual what happens in the episode the objective review or whatever you want to call it they will lie about that. They will piss on you and tell you that it's raining. If a supposed reviewer can't even do the baseline thing of accurately representing what happens in the episode itself, then what else are they willing to lie about? If they're willing to lie about such obvious shit, then you need to ask yourself, if you're a fan of Bolstrak, if you're a fan of these other reactionary anti-woke YouTubers or whatever, what else are they willing to lie to you about? And why haven't you noticed it before? Or why haven't you called it out? What about their content is preventing you from calling this obvious lie out? Then the unit white dudes and ladies get brain scanned. And now they're evil. So everything makes sense again. Next, Tiddly Oh, so it's not just the fact that there was a Sikh member of, of unit. It's that, oh, there were white unit soldiers and now they're turned evil. <laughs> that was actually fucking dumber than I thought it would be. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got to play the clip again. We've got to go back to the live footage of Bolstrek's house. It's okay, birdie. It's okay, birdie. Oh, the, the, you're not watching Doctor Who anymore, so they can't insult the white people. I'm gonna take care of you, I'm gonna take care of you. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't take out the bins because them's too good for that and has a discussion with non-gender descript furry. Them's too good. She's got an alien in the shed. She, she has different priorities right now.
thing about how misunderstood and how differently special she is. Gee, Russell, whatever could you be getting at there? So subtle, dude. Non-gender descript furry thing wants to go home. That's the feeling for most of us, non-gender descript furry thing. Then Donna discovers non-gender descript furry thing and is horrified. Yeah, Donna, I know, but this is the best they could do. Then Dr. Desperation shows up and Donna's mom clocks him right in the mouth. Take that, you evil patriarchal bastard. Then Dad shows up and he seems... Like I said, fucking brain rot. She thinks that if Donna sees him, her daughter will die. And you've somehow twisted that into you patriarchal bastard. Like, this is what I'm on about when I say that fans just want the fun sci-fi show. We want the character drama. We want the storytelling. Bolstrek's the one who's bringing politics and patriarchy and everything into this. We just want the fun blue box show. But Bolstrek is like, no, can't have that. I've got a victim complex that desperately needs maintaining. Then Major Singh is here to keep white army dudes in line. But they tell him to get- I knew he'd do it! I knew he'd do it! People like Bolstrak are so fucking predictable that you can see their talking points from fucking orbit. Right, I've got to run errands real quick. We'll return to this later. There we go, errands run. Uh, it's gotten a lot colder, so I've put a jacket on. Let's continue. Then Dr. Desperation makes the mistake of assuming non-gender descript furry things gender and tiddlywinks lets him have it. No, I didn't make that up. That's an act- you did make that up. He doesn't let him have it. What, like, like I said, just a basic objective detail. It's just doesn't matter. They were going to be angry about this no matter what they did. Actual scene. Non-gender descript furry thing says its pronouns is the or the. And I find myself in disbelief at the over-the-top pandering. It seems the alien thing. Like I said, Doctor Who's been doing this since the 1970s explicitly and the 1960s implicitly. Things want the non-gender descript furry things fur. Oh dear. Then white evil military dudes show up and start being toxic. Then we get more boom boom. <laughs> he's, he's just so obsessed with race. So, ooh, and look who's appeared. Almost on cue. A black cat. Ooh. Explosions as Donna's host blows up. Well, perhaps you shouldn't have given that 166 million pounds for stupid plot points. Now, to be fair, they do lampshade that a bit. Like, kind of true, but they do lampshade it feel like an idiot. Dr. Desperation then starts creating shields with a sonic screwdriver because apparently it does that now. I can think of several times in the past where this might have helped, dude. Then bug-eyed dudes march- Yes, and that was the past. This is a new Sonic. Like, th th like that's a germ of an actual legit criticism there, but he's completely incapable of making it because of some weird comprehension deficiency, some inability in the brain to process critical thought. ...on the street while stuff is on fire because, once again, Russell is incapable of original thought unless it has to do with current eurisms. Boom, boom, splo- so, okay, so what Russell can't do anymore, apparently, London, aliens, specifically crash landings, and fire. <laughs> then they escape through the house of a lazy white dude, representative of the plebs, because Russell couldn't help- Oh my god, he's so obsessed with race! He's so obs- it's- he, he can't perceive anything else! himself then blowy blowy boom boom then dr desperation teleports the bug eye dudes for trial then we learn that the bug eye dudes weren't the bad guys at all guess that means we won't be seeing the white soldier guys and gals again but then the white soldier guys uh, i mean we do like this isn't like a reaction video this is an actual edited review so he's seen the episode he knows that they they do come back Gals are serving non-gender descript furry thing, so everything makes sense again. Then we learn that non-gender descript furry thing is actually the villain as Russell proceeds with self-wankery, thinking of how clever he is. Then things get silly. Now here's then the thing, though, is that the villain of the story is the gender non-defiable woke creature or whatever, but that acknowledgement, that hypocrisy that Bolstrak has built his entire identity, this entire review around, is just not going to get commented upon. Non -gender descript also, Winnie's attacking the microphone. Stop it furry thing refers to tiddlywinks as donna's weird child so we get the point that it's evil then dr desperation starts <laughs> that is true i actually do really like that trope chucky the tv series did it as well uh saying oh i've got i've got a kid gender fluid you know i'm okay with queer people because i'm not a monster and they knock him unconscious because that's enough from you you white patriarchal bastard then donna starts <laughs> they're the doctor Knocking them out is the most tactically advantageous thing for them to do. Why are we getting so mad and, most importantly, racializing common sense? ...to regret giving away her money for virtue signaling purposes. Well, you made the idiotic decision... Virtue... No, 
donating them to charity is that's the opposite of virtue signaling isn't it isn't virtue signaling just announcing your good intentions or just implying your goodness your inherent goodness through speaking in action and not action that's why it's signaling you're not doing anything you're signaling it but donna donated over a hundred million pounds to charity that's the opposite of signaling that's active participation like why am I explaining this? Gives Donna her memory back, Donna dies, but then doesn't die because it seems that Tiddlywinks was the center of the universe all along. Non-gender descript furry thing's plan to launch its spaceship has failed. Oh no, now let's quote some lines. Binary, non-binary, we're binary, she's not, because the doctor's male and female, and neither, and more. Yep, those lines were said, then non-gender descript furry thing gets sent. Yes, describe what the issue is then. Like... <laughs> Come on, give us something basic. Give us literally anything. Then off to prison and mentions the boss. Oh, whatever could this mean? Let me pretend to care. Then Dr. Desperation tells Donna and Tiddlywinks that they have to give up their metacrisis silliness. And here's some more lines that were actually uttered by Donna and Tiddlywinks. We know everything and you know nothing. It's a shame that you're not a woman anymore because she'd have understood. We've got all the power, but there is a way to get rid of it. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. Just let it go and we choose to let it go. Good Lord! Then Dr. Desperation and Donna... Yeah, like, he's got, he's not got anything. He just assumes that just this on its own is enough, when it really isn't. He actually should be making a case for it. The fact that this is the scene that keeps on getting being brought up time and time and time again in these videos, it kind of shows that there is, like, zero original thought here. They're just repeating, regurgitating the exact same talking points, the exact same things. There's just nothing going on here. These are empty heads collectively. He choose to let it go. Good lord! Then Dr. Desperation and Donna head to the new TARDIS, which immediately gets boom boom, explosion, blowy blowy boom booms. I don't know if I'm going to cover the rest of these because this was just painful to sit through. We shall see. But that's it for today. Don't forget to come yell at me on Elon's busted Twitter. And until next time... Uh, he is definitely going to cover the future episodes, 100%. The persecution complex just demands more material. It just demands more things to pretend to get angry at. Next up, let's take a look at uh, Gobster. Uh, now, um, I'm mainly talking about him because he uh, did a video about me before, which I've already reacted to, but this one was requested by people in my Discord server. I'm not going to look at the full thing uh, because, like I said, I do think this is slightly low-hanging fruit considering the size of the channel, but uh, someone in my Discord server really wanted me to take a look at this particular segment in his review of the Star Beast. Doctor Who, the Star Beast, or should that have been the message? Now, the message is spelt correctly in the video title but not on the thumbnail it only has one s on the thumbnail so that should probably be fixed but anyway i'm splitting hairs here let's take a look so yeah not the greatest thing um it's a shame as i said i've said it at the time and i'll keep saying it it could have been a really really good episode it could have been enjoyable it could have drug, dragged people back in but it's all about the message and then afterwards we get this see, there's that term again the message let's see if he actually clarifies anything little gem which uh, well let's just play it and uh, let's see what he has to say that'll be interesting not just representation for representation sake either Russell R Rose is a character there's a lot more so this is a clip from Doctor Who Unleashed the behind the scenes sister show of Doctor Who uh, there's Stefan Powell the host interviewing Russell T Davis and Yasmin Finney who plays Rose Noble in the episode more going on there than absolutely it actually becomes a vital part of the plot that the it becomes a vital part of the plot because it doesn't mean it that she becomes a vital part of the plot because she's part of the resolution not it like so this is just gobster just mishearing russell t davis like or rose is a character and russell's like You're, yeah she's not just a character but she's vital to the plot so firstly right we're going right out of the gate with just gobster just flat out mishearing but let's see where he goes with this the doctor re makes donna remember Donna sacrifices herself and dies, but because her metacrisis energy somehow has gone into a male and a female, a binary, non-binary person, she has it and he was Donna. Basically all time lords. Non-binary, it's not, it, this is the reason. Yeah, the whole reason, but I'll carry on. The rose contains the he and the she and the neither and the both, yeah. and that's a new future. That the rose goes beyond words, beyond definitions. And it is important. I think that visibility thing, I said before, is like as you were saying, if you grow up seeing this, this stuff, homophobia and transphobia happens when it's something you've never seen. That's utter rubbish. 
That is utter, utter rubbish. It's because you haven't seen... Uh, firstly, no, no, that's that's absolutely not rubbish. There have been genuine, like, decades worth of scientific studies and sociological studies looking at people reacting and responding to representation. For example, if you have in a TV show a character who is from a marginalized group, the more you watch and engage with that character on TV or in media, a viewer treats them mentally almost like a member of the family and becomes more accepting and becomes more open to stuff. There's a reason why in, for example, in urban places, in cities with more diverse populations, the people there are generally more tolerant because they're much more used to the diversity that an urban environment a city would have and the same thing here applies for media as well i don't think russell is being literal in that something you've never seen before that does absolutely play a factor but if it's something that you've not had any sort of exposure to you know i think what russell here has made complete sense and the science and the data absolutely backs that up you have fear against it i never met a gay person in my life never seen a gay person in my life didn't hate them I haven't seen or met, I have now, and I know a few trans people, and they're awesome human beings. And there's nothing wrong with being trans if that's what you want to be. But I had no fear or anger or hate against them. So by saying, because you don't see it, that's where your hate comes from, is just utter shit. The data completely supports all of this, but okay. Propaganda bullshit. Propaganda bullshit is just basic facts? Okay, thanks. You can temper that reaction and change it if you introduce these images to people happily and normally and calmly when they're young. Did you get that? Did you get that? Just to let you know. Mm -hmm. When they're young. They're when they're young. Let's just go through it again. Only when they're young. When they're young. Are so we going to get a full think of the children spiel here from Gobster? Because like, this is not just for trans people or LGBTQ plus re representation, but this is for things like race. This is for things like disability. There's a reason why a priority in children's TV is to normalize disability. It's why there's so many children's hosts in wheelchairs or other children's hosts and presenters with visible disabilities. Because if you normalize this for children, then it prevents people from feeling othered. Not just the people who are being represented, but the people who are watching who aren't part of that group. They become a more understanding and much more tolerance like th th this is like just basic stuff but gobster seems to be trying to make this some sort of think of the children's social contagion conspiracy thing the whole idea of this episode was not to bring back doctor who but was to show transphobia in its brightest light so our children cannot feel guilty or upset or get angry about it the whole point of the episode, she's just a supporting character in a 60-minute story that's about a meep space alien adapted from the Star Beast and the Doctor Donna, so that's a massive stretch. You see, what you're doing there is you're saying this show has been put on, Russell, for propaganda reasons to show children that changing your sex and changing your gender, it's normal, don't worry about it, it's fine, and it's super cool. That was the whole point of this episode. It, it wasn't the whole point. It was just a supporting character. It, it's a multifaceted episode that's trying to do a lot of things, and this is one of them. And also, like I said, when it comes to like disabled people or people of colour and such, in children's entertainment or media that is going to be predominantly watched by children like Doctor Who, what's wrong with that? Like, you, you need to actually start justifying these points rather than trying to start uh, some Think of the Children rampage. That it just becomes normal. It is normal. I don't mean to say it's normal, but that normality just becomes part of the world. You're not stressed, you don't freak, you don't react, you don't, you don't lost anything, you don't hate anything. It's a better world. Is it a better world, though? Yes. Because what you're saying is you will accept our viewpoint, whether you like it or not. Now, as I said, I know trans people, I know gay people, I know lesbians, I know all these sort of people, and they're all wonderful people. They genuinely are awesome people. I have no hate to them. They, they just shouldn't be on TV? Uh, that, that seems to be the implication here. But the big difference is, is they respect me as much as I respect them. I respect them for who they are, and they respect me whether I like things or not. They don't force their opinion on me, they don't force their attitude, they don't... This, me... this isn't forced on you. You can just not watch the show. You can just not watch the behind-the-scenes interviews talking about it. You can just step away. This, this isn't forced on you. What? To think their way, or else I'm evil. That is, no, no one has said that here, but okay. Isn't how it works. But what he's saying is, and what he really shouldn't have said, is this is so we can program the young. That's that's not what he said. In a world and in an environment where parents don't want their children to be exposed to this until they're old enough to make their own decisions. Yeah. And that's 18 in my eyes. Maybe 16 for some people, but 18 for me. At 18, you can make your own decisions about your own life. 16, you can negotiate decisions but until you're 18 you can't make them 
So anyone under 18. You could make this argument about almost anything, really, when it comes to progressive representation. Like, and like I said, this isn't just trans people. This is like disabled people. This is people of color. This is people from other marginalized groups just being represented in media in pretty basic ways. Like 10 or 15 years ago, would Gobster be saying this stuff about homosexuality being depicted in children's media or same-sex relationships being depicted in media that is meant to be watched by kids? And the whole keep it away from them until they're 18 years old, that is such a slippery slope because if you're willing to think about about that thought process, then you also have to start considering what about media that children watch even when they're not 18? Children watch horror movies when they're too young to. People, like for example, I used to watch South Park all the time in Family Guy before I was 15 years old or whatever the official age rating of those shows was. So then the argument then becomes don't depict it in media at all in case children might watch it. This guy just strikes me as an individual who's never thought about the positions that he holds even for a moment. Shouldn't be told that changing your sex is fine. It is fine. You are going to have queer, like, young people. You are going to have queer teenagers like Yasmin Finney is in the show. Rose is 15 years old or 16 years old. That's just a reality, but you're here saying that we can't even negotiate that until we're 16? It removes the agency from younger audiences and perceives them more as, like, <laughs> unironically as a form of property. Just people without agency who are unable to make decisions on their own and who you think are so weak-willed that just seeing a trans person in an episode of Doctor Who is going to socially condition you or whatever. Because it's cool, because it's on TV and that's fine. You can do that. No. No. So what you Once again, you could apply this to even something as basic as homosexuality. So what you're doing, basically, uh, Russell, is saying that this episode of Doctor Who was for groomers. We're pushing... No. Oh my... Like, so yeah, this guy just comes right out with the subtext. If you want to have queer representation in a piece of media that's going to be watched by people under the age of 18, then you are a groomer. And remember, he's saying this about Russell T. Davis, a gay man, an openly gay man, a famously gay man, as we like to say on this channel. And he's just like, oh yeah, he's a groomer because he's put Yasmin Finney in a TV show. The absolute delusion. And let's not forget that Gobster, the reason that he first talked about me on his own channel a few weeks ago was because he was angry about my opinions on Noel Clark. Now, obviously, Gobster is allowed to think that um, Noel Clark is innocent. We'll wait for the legal system to play out, of course, there. But he has unironically become the very thing that I was mocking in the video. Let's, let's just go back and listen to this. So in any case, he then comes up, he goes, also, it's interesting to look at the accounts of people who defend Noel Clark, no questions asked. Person, false accusations, sexual misconduct are terrible and those who do them should be punished. Yes, they should do. Also, people who make false accusations about knowing facts when there aren't any should also be punished, don't you think? Same person, all gays are groomers. No joke, I see this pattern. No, no joke, you're an idiot. <laughs> He's become the very thing that I was making fun of and that he denied the very existence of. You genuinely couldn't write it. I would say that it makes me think that this guy might be just very, very committed to the bit, but the fact that he's able to make a video like this and actually lean into that stereotype that I was poking fun at online and being like, yeah, if you depict trans people in media that could be watched by people at the age of 18, you are a groomer. And I am saying this about a gay man who works in TV. Come on. In our agenda. And you've just said that the, sh the Rose storyline, or Jason, as she was originally known, was pinnacle to the plot. This wasn't about Doctor Who. No, Rose was pinnacle to the plot. This was about trans people. Pure and simple. You've actually said it in your own words. He didn't say that in his own words. Like, you you've misrepresented him, and now you are getting angry at the misrepresented version that you've made up in your brain. You've actually said that the show was resigned round Rose to push Rose's position. That's, that's, that's not what he said. Basic comprehension. You do genuinely have to wonder if these people do actually believe what they're saying because they are just openly lying about stuff that they show. They played the clip. He didn't say that. And here he is a couple of minutes later just making stuff up and hoping that you folks will just accept it. Speaking of people who will just lie about obvious things, we've got pathological liar and Nazi platformer, Nerdrotic. This is easily the most viewed Doctor Who review on the Starbeast that I've seen, nearly 600,000 views after a couple of days. Doctor Who is dead, murdered by the message. There's that term again. I wonder if Gary is going to be the first one to actually define it. This will be interesting. Greetings, you over 910,000 Awakening Wonders and the 40% who haven't... Awakening Wonders is what Russell Brand would say. 
Um, okay, I'm just gonna leave that statement there. Subscribed yet? I know it's been a while, but we're gonna talk about Doctor Who. At time of recording, it is the 60th anniversary of the greatest television show of all time. Shame it died in 2017. It's also been over a year since the last episode of the first female doctor played by Jodie Whittaker, who we will lovingly call Dr. Karen. Who could forget- oh My God, he's still doing the Dr. Karen thing. Firstly, it doesn't even make any sort of sense from his perspective because Karen is a meme against uptight conservative women. And isn't the first 13th doctor supposed to be super woke from the BBC left-wing propagandists or whatever? But also the fact that he's still hitting that joke into the ground five years later. There's nothing funnier than a joke you repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Ah, oh dear. One of the worst television runs in her story. After a promising start with some pretty impressive ratings, it all went downhill, including some of the worst ratings for the television show in its entire history, and some of the worst audience scores, including a brief moment at 0% on Rotten. We covered this at the time. At the time, this happened because of a very deliberate and coordinated campaign of review bombing that Gary appeared to be spearheading. Audience review metrics over the past few years have just gone to shit. They are just not emblematic of any sort of quality at this point. Partly because of massive agenda pushing from people like Gary. Rotten Tomatoes. But that's not all. It wasn't enough to replace the well-established male character that was- This looks weird. Like, it looks weird to see um, Doctor Who being upscaled like this. I presume it's some sort of like AI upscaling or something. It looks it looks weird. It creeps me out a little bit. The Doctor with the first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker, they also had to completely alter the canon. With the horrific Timeless Children were 55 plus years of a- God, we really are spending a lot of time trying to set the scene here established television and an established character was completely redone in a five minute voiceover when they replaced the first doctor played by william hartnell with a young diverse girl okay one thing you're gonna learn about nerd Rotic real quick if you watch him for any amount of time he just does not want to see black people in media this is a pretty explicit thing his main issue with the timeless child isn't so much the rewriting of doctor who history it's the fact that they made the first incarnation of the time lord known as the doctor a young black girl and that is about 90% of his criticism. Cards on the table here, my issue with the Timeless Child isn't so much the concept or the principle of it, it's the fact that they did this massive retcon and then did nothing with it. Changing Doctor Who history, changing Time Lord canon and the history of the Doctor themselves as a character is like a long running tradition in the show. But if you're going to do it, you actually have to tell stories about that, you have to do something with the characters and really they just did this massive like retcon bomb and then did nothing with it, that's the main issue. In my opinion, at least. I'm not having to go at Gary for not liking the Timeless Child as a concept. But like I said, his main issue is, oh, young, diverse girl. William Hartnell was no longer the first Doctor. The Doctor was- No, that wasn't the case. That William Hartnell is always the first Doctor. In the episode, they established that the Doctor got like a brand new set of regenerations and had their memory wiped. So the Hartnell Doctor is the first Doctor, whatever. Was no longer from Gallifrey and this show was- That's left ambiguous. Dead, making Doctor Who the worst case of message-assisted Mary suicide in all of entertainment. We really are going through the box ticking here. Mary suicide, herstory, etc. God, these guys really do like to run their wordplay into the ground. All of entertainment. Then, when all seemed lost, the impossible happened. After spending years saying he would never return to Doctor Who, Russell T. Davies did just that. And not just that, he brought David Tennant and Catherine Tate with him. Animals, eh? For a set of 60th anniversary specials, the Whovians who remained rejoiced. Then later, it was announced that the Doctor would once again be a man. Could it be that the BBC... And then Nerdrotic immediately had an issue with Shooty Gatwa because he doesn't want black people in media. This is evident from his very first red carpet interview. I even reacted to it a few years ago, Nerdrotic going for that first BAFTA red carpet interview, and Nerdrotic's response was just... Like, that's a direct quote, and it's probably the most intelligent thing he's ever said. Be a man. Could it be that the BBC wanted to genuinely bring fans back to one of its biggest shows? Prioritizing good stories over... The message. Short Ooh. 
are we actually getting something about the message? Let's have a look at this. Okay, let's work together. Don't really know what's an issue with that. Uh, uh, Rosie the Riveter, World War Propaganda for the women to work while the men are on the front lines. I don't really see what an issue with that is. Salu, hi, bye, hola. Okay, so learning different languages. That's not really an issue here. Uh, on the bottom right, we've got um, hands raised with hearts in them. I, I don't know. Um, equality. N okay, nothing wrong with that. I don't know what this family here is. Social justice with scales. I don't know what the issue... What's this old... Okay, old people in media is bad because that's part of the... What? Jigsaw pieces, education. Yep, education is good. Uh, the earth, so apparently, uh, you know, environmental messaging, something Doctor Who has clearly never done in the past. Uh, diversity, people holding hands, a safe zone, uh, more feminism, a rainbow, LGBTQ+, I imagine. Uh, people on... Okay, so this is apparently what the message is, and there's nothing wrong with any of this? It, in fact, it seems like the vast majority of this is stuff that Doctor Who has been doing since... Let me check, since 1963? I don't know, maybe Gary will elaborate, but this is honestly the closest that we've seen in this video so far of anyone defining what the message is, and it's just, okay, I'm gonna need uh, some explanation here. Message. Short answer, no. All it took to dash a lot of fans' hopes was the very first interview with the new 14th Doctor, Shuri Gatwa. He's a Time Lord. He's literally an alien. They are an alien. The Doctor is not from anywhere it's like they don't fit in anywhere and i think for marginalized people they have been a real beacon of kind of feeling like seen in a way i have a bad feeling about this i feel like no no what's the issue with that there was absolutely nothing wrong with what he just said and to use peter capaldi somebody who thinks that shooty gatwa is a great choice to play the doctor you know fellow scottish representation like, to use Peter Capaldi to try and poo-poo what Shooty Gat was said, a completely reasonable thing to say. Like, I'm gonna, like, do you not have an argument? Like, is what he's saying so obviously on the face of it okay that Gary could come up with nothing to actually respond? I feel like we've all got a lot bolder with the messages and the mm. conversations that we're opening up. Okay, fuckity bye. Then, uh, once again... What's happened? What, what's wrong with this? Like, I've, I, I have seen this red carpet interview with Shooter Gatwa. This is the one that Gary responded to and just went when he saw that the actor was a black man. But, like, what, what's wrong with this? The question that this interviewer asks Shooter Gatwa and Russell T. Davis is, what have the past few years of TV meant to you? And then Shooter Gatwa, as a Rwandan-born immigrant who was whose parents were fleeing a genocide, a queer black man growing up in Scotland and then working on shows like Sex Education, working on movies like Barbie and now being the next Doctor. Like, you know, what what did the past few years in TV meant to you? And he answered completely appropriately and fine. And Gary seems to have nothing to actually respond with. Like, this is clearly absolutely fine. And I think Gary knows it. I think Gary knows that this is absolutely fine, which is why he has to put the passive aggressive Peter Capaldi quotes on screen in lieu of an actual argument. It just seems that Gary is just just way too cowardly to come forward with his actual opinions on something so he just has to infer infer but passive aggressive editing is not an argument passive aggressive editing is not an actual response all got a lot bolder with the messages and the conversations that were opening up okay fuckity bye then the unthinkable happened the worst nightmare for any science fiction fan any fan of anything good and any whovian disney got involved with Doctor Who, not just to distribute it, to finance it. I wish I could say things got better, but like, they- okay, But like, what's the issue with that? Like, I'm asking rhetorically here, in this bubble, in this video itself, like, there's no actual argument here. He's not demonstrated anything. Like, he's not even showing anything on screen about what's bad about this. He's showing the headlines confirming the deal. Like, does he not have an actual opinion on this? I mean, he clearly does have an opinion on it, but why won't he say it? I wish I could say things got better, but they didn't, because the lead-up to the 60th anniversary has been nothing short of abysmal, and I'm not even talking about Doomsday. Hi, I'm Doom. I'm the universe's greatest assassin. If you see the doctor, tell them I'm on my way. What the f I wish it ended there. <laughs> So he doesn't have an argument. Like, I didn't like the trailers for Doomsday either, but I can actually point to stuff. I could even, like, play devil's advocate and be like, yeah, it was a cheap trailer, but maybe the actual material that it's promoting might be good. Like, is he so unprincipled that he won't even put forward an opinion?
Then we got our first look at the 14th Doctor and Davros in a cringe children in need special that I could have completely forgotten about, except Russell T. Davies decided to make it even worse. There's a problem with the Davros of old in that uh, he's a wheelchair user who is evil. And I had problems with that. And a lot of us on the production team had the problems with that of associating disability with evil. I say, this is how we see Davros now. This is what he looks like. This is 2023 and he looks like this now. And that we are absolutely standing by. Yes, it's political correctness gone mad. And if you're just watching this video and don't know anything about Doctor Who, I don't know why, but thank you. Davros, the creator of the Daleks and one of the most iconic villains of Doctor Who has now been fundamentally changed. And it would be equal to changing Darth Vader because you didn't want to offend anybody with prosthetic limbs. No, well, okay. Firstly, that is the dumbest example that he could have given because Darth Vader has been depicted as somebody without prosthetic limbs without his breathing apparatus without his life support system they're called the star wars prequel films and the same thing is happening here davros has not been fundamentally changed destination scarrow this children in need skit is obviously a prequel to genesis of the daleks is obviously a prequel to before davros had his accident so not only is this a stupid argument but gary actually gave the perfect counter example for why this was an okay thing to do that media has done before because you didn't want to offend anybody with prosthetic limbs. I will say though, it is really disingenuous for Gary to try and act all high and mighty, trying to look out for people with prosthetic limbs who don't want to be offended, considering that Gary doesn't think that disabled people should be represented in media anyway. A couple of years ago, we reacted to his live stream review reaction of the Halloween apocalypse with Heel vs. Babyface, and that story has got Nadia Albina in it, who is a actress with one arm, and Gary and Heel vs. Babyface were so, like, visibly uncomfortable with the idea of a disabled woman being in a TV show that they had to like change the subject because they were just so upset by it. So for Gary to pretend to act indignant on behalf of disabled people, a demographic he thinks shouldn't even be appearing in media or at least, you know, Doctor Who, honestly, that makes me feel pretty uncomfortable. Despite all that, the first of three Doctor Who specials celebrating its 60th anniversary has arrived. The return of David Tennant, the return of Catherine Tate, the return of Russell T. Davies. Was it a celebration of, let's just be real, a little over five decades of great entertainment or just another modern franchise being sacrificed on the altar of agenda? Again, if you guess the latter, then you'd be... Like, like what agenda? Come on, I don't think he's going to even name anything. Correct, because the now third reboot of Doctor Who was murdered in its crib. If anyone at the BBC Bad Wolf or Disney, including Russell T. Davies, thinks this is going to bring back old fans or even more important, bring in new ones, I would suggest you stop getting high on the supply of your own farts. But at least we know the answer to one question. Why did Russell T. Davies return in the first place? It's obvious. To use Doctor Who as a delivery mechanism for, you guessed it, the message. What makes this worse is it- I mean, if we're talking about LGBTQ plus representation, which I'm pretty confident that he's referring to here, considering the footage the british lgbt awards because russell t davis that infamously apolitical writer who never puts forward queer representation in his work from you know queer as folk it's a sin the original run of doctor who with characters like captain jack harkness i think we're i think we're dealing with another case of everything before i don't know 2014 2015 was not political and not woke and now everything after that is woke not because things fundamentally changed in terms of how media is made and how representation is done, but because they grew up and only just started noticing this stuff. What makes this worse is it features David Tennant and Catherine Tate. It could have been a mediocre episode at best, but it couldn't get out of its own way. The Star Beast is based on a comic strip of the same name written by Pat Mills, John Wagner, and illustrated by Watchmen's Dave Gibbons. After the first female doctor played by Jodie Whittaker transitions, I'm sorry, regenerates into David Tenet's 14th Doctor, a new Doctor wearing an old face, he returns to Earth and immediately runs into his old companion Donna Noble and her husband Sean, along with their daughter Rose. Honestly, I- Okay, so this is just obvious like transphobia, you know, daughter. He doesn't think that she's a woman. Uh, we even saw this on the thumbnail as well with Yasmin Finney being represented with, I think that's The Rock's body, just Yasmin Finney's face on a male professional wrestler's body, just out and out contempt for queer people. Here's the thing though, Nerdrotic knows full well that he had to edit a photo like this because there's absolutely no way you can look at this woman and think, yeah, that, you know, 
that's a man. Like, absolutely no fucking way. Absolutely no shot. No way can Gary, no way can Gary in his heart of hearts credibly say woman in quotes with the quotes. Honestly, I feel a bit silly even breaking down the plot for you guys because it was so meaningless to this episode. Anyway, right around. There's also genuinely a 90% chance that Gary didn't even watch the actual episode itself. He does have priors for just doing reviews and just making shit up in the episode itself. Like I said, the re review of the Halloween apocalypse, there was just, it was just littered with factual inaccuracies about what happened in the story. Uh, there was the review that he did with white supremacist and neo-Nazi Bolstrek, where Bolstrek said that a white dude is the villain and nerdrotic and starry-eyed girl who was in the in the live stream as well just nodded along and were like yeah yeah even though that categorically was not true the villains of fugitive of the jadoon was a woman of color and a rhino so like i said there was a genuine chance that gary didn't even fucking watch the episode on the same time a spaceship crash lands while releasing an escape pod and eventually donna's daughter rose yep just repeat the joke over and over again whatever helps you cope at night buddy as far as the characters go, David Tennant is good as the Doctor, as he usually is, but I have to agree with my good friend Bowles Trek, it feels a little Okay, I have had so many people who are fans of Nerdorotic on my case for me saying that Nerdorotic is a Nazi platformer. And I'm so glad that we reacted to the Bolstrek review before we got to this video. Because you've seen how fucking demented Bolstrek is. Somebody who thinks that the Jews were responsible for series 10, who cannot watch an episode of Doctor Who without being fixated on the skin colour of the supporting characters, including the background extras. Somebody who, like Gary, also thinks that disabled people should not be in media, and so many people saying, he doesn't platform him, he doesn't platform him, despite the fact that Bolstrek, A, has been on multiple live streams with Nerdrotic, and B, the fact that not only is he getting positively mentioned and quoted here, but is called his good friend? Why is Nerdrotic friends with an open fucking Nazi? Why is he also platformed people like Gavin McGuinness, the founder of The Proud Boys? Convicted fake news spreader Alex Jones? Hmm, hmm, it just happens to be a massive coincidence that some of Nerdrotic's biggest guests are genuinely neo-Nazis. Bit like an aging rock star going out on a reunion tour. Still, he's good and so is Catherine Tate as Donna Noble, as well as Sean, her husband, and her mom, Sylvia. Unfortunately, it's all wasted on this propaganda. We're also introduced to two new characters, including Shirley Ann Bingham, a unit science advisor who's in a wheelchair that can fire knockout darts and missiles. Unfortunately, I think units going through some budget cuts because they have access to alien technology, but they can't provide her with an exoskeleton, a hovering wheelchair, or even a motorized wheelchair. This brings us to Donna's okay there was a lot there firstly why did the editor put fart sound effects on the darts and the missiles it just seems like they're trying to infantilize and mock the idea of somebody in a wheelchair secondly Shirley is unit scientific advisor a role that requires some sort of public facing so why would unit give Shirley some elaborate alien or super sophisticated wheelchair or transportation technology when they're meant to be way more covert? You don't want Shirley to be in the alien power loader on the street so that people can see her. And thirdly, this sounds like a fucking parody of what an anti-woke YouTuber would say in regards to disabled representation. How do you improve the disabled representation on screen? Oh, you know, just make them not disabled anymore. Like I said, this sounds like a parody, but Nerd Rock genuine suggestion for how to improve disabled representation in media is to just have them not be disabled anymore. Jesus Christ, we knew that Nerdrotic was incredibly uncomfortable with the idea of disabled people being in media, but fucking hell. Genuinely fucking ridiculous, said by somebody who has absolutely lost the fucking plot. Brings us to Donna's daughter, Rose played by Yasmin Finney, a 20-year-old actor playing a 15-year-old child. The centerpiece of this- I, I mean, she looks young. And also, one second. Also, she's 20 now. She filmed this like two years ago, so she was 18 playing 15. That That's fine. 60th anniversary special of Doctor Who and The Message. Not for Yasmin's acting ability because- so, so the message is just- queer people in media. That In this context, that's just what Gary's referring to, because queer people in media special of Doctor Who and The Message. Not for Yasmin's acting ability, because that really doesn't exist. It's for the actor's existence. Don't believe me? We'll let the episode speak for itself. We're told time and time again that Rose is beautiful. The most beautiful daughter in the world. You look absolutely gorgeous. When I say she looks gorgeous, 
Is that right? Does she look gorgeous? Actually, I will say, I'll give props to Nerdrotic's editor. I don't know what they've done, but they've managed to get rid of the music in the background, and we've got pretty clear, like, isolated audio tracks here. Even though the episode has only been out for a couple of days, you know, props to the editor. I, I you know, I'll, I'll give them that in terms of the technical proficiency. How lucky am I? She's brilliant. She's got this beautiful daughter. She's happy. Okay, I get it. I got a question for Doctor Who. So so you just, instead of an actual argument, instead of an actual criticism, you just use a, once again, another passive aggressive clip. Fans out there, do you fire up your anniversary special expecting something retrospective, maybe something a little new, maybe something fun, or do you want to see the doctor corrected after a misuse of pronouns? Don't you dare. Meet me. Yes, the meat. I promise I can help him get home and then- God's sake, it's just the same fucking shit. Like, there's no original thought. There's no deviating from their quote message. It should, it's just the exact same scenes. It's the exact same fucking talking points. See me again. You're assuming he as a pronoun. True. Yes, sorry, good point. Are you he or she or they? My chosen pronoun is the definite article. I am- You, you know what's pretty mad? I, this is like a slight tangent though, but like Council of Geeks only used like a couple of seconds of footage from the Star Beasts in their review, and the BBC manually blocked it. But even though the Content ID library should also be picking up the audio of this scene, you know, th this review hasn't been blocked. Now, I'm not saying that the BBC should be striking down negative reviews, they shouldn't be striking down any reviews, but you know, the optics aren't great. We've got a queer creator who is doing a pretty positive review of the latest special and that gets blocked, but the BBC allow this. Like I said, to clarify, the BBC shouldn't be blocking any reviews. It's just, it's just a shit situation. I am always the me. So now trigger warning for potentially- like, he, he doesn't even have like an actual response or an issue. It's just passive aggressive Capaldi watching. Like the, the definite article pronoun of the meep is the same pronoun as the main character of the show for the past 60 years. But like, he doesn't even have a fucking response to it. I've had so many people over the past couple of days say, Nerdrotic's not bigoted, he's not bigoted, he's like, things like that. And now, playing extreme devil's advocate here, I can kind of see how they get that impression, because it seems like Gary doesn't actually fucking say anything. It's all just passive-aggressive implication. You know, except for the bit earlier where he's just like, yeah, disabled people, you can only be in media if we can't tell you're disabled. Or if you have some sort of weird infantilizing future technology, like a chair for Davros or a hovercraft for Shirley. Like, strange infantilization that disabled people can only be depicted in media through some sci-fi abstraction. I know I'm harping on the disabled point, but Jesus Christ, that's fucking vile. Genuinely vile, vile from Gary. For a potentially contentious conversation, if you don't mind my leading myself into this, which is that of dead naming. Uh, Rose at one point is dead named in the street by some kids calling her by her dead name. Oh, hi, looking good, Jason. Well, give us a kiss, Jay boy. <laughs> Oh, get them. I personally think we should stare into difficult stuff like Okay, is Gary actually going to have a response to this, or is he just going to do some passive-aggressive editing? I'm leaning on the latter. This, so what do you think? I feel that it is important to show the lived reality of trans people. To, to my mind, as a trans person and as a writer, there is no point in trying to sugar the pill. Trans people face transphobia. Mm. And... It happens. I'm bored. But Russell T Davies and Yeah, just passive aggressive editing. First things first, you could do that with fucking anyone who takes like a second pause during a conversation and put like the modem, the computer booting sound effect. That's a, that, like, that's not an argument. And yeah, Gary just has nothing to say. Honestly, this use of footage going back to the content ID stuff doesn't really fall into fair use because he's not actually commentating. He's not transforming it. He's, 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 he, this, he's not being critical. There's no real commentary here. It's just passive aggressive editing. But Russell T Davies and company really bring it home with their outright work worship of agenda by committing one of the worst crimes against imagination. You could put it right up there with Ridley Scott screwing up Alien. By going back and undoing one of the greatest stories in Modern Who that Russell T. Davies wrote, The Dr. Donna. I'll try to keep this brief because the only thing that equals the amount of agenda that's in this episode is the amount of exposition, long story short. AKA only about a minute's worth? <laughs> what? Like I said, they're going through the same scenes, they're going through the same quotes and stuff, and it only amounts to about a minute in an hour-long special. It kind of shows how little they've got to work with here. If she remembers the doctor, she will die. It was a brilliant, beautiful, and bittersweet story. Donna got her happy ending, but she could never see the doctor again. And Russell T. Davies completely undid his own work 
not to tell a good story, but to send a message. I and mean, it's only part one of three, so we don't really know what the full story is here, but okay. It turns out it was more than just remembering the Doctor. Apparently, Donna's the Winter Soldier now, and her memory could be unlocked with a code. Through a series of contrived events, Donna is needed to keep the Meep ship from taking off and destroying... Like, it's similar to Bolstrak. He doesn't actually seem to have any substantial criticism, so we just have to throw in jibes every so often. Like, I want to know, what does Nerdrotic think of the structure? What does he think of the plotting? Stuff like that. But he's not interested in having any sort of substantial conversation here. Ironically, he is pushing his own The Message. I'm genuinely curious as to what he thinks of Hellbent, because Hellbent, the Series 9 finale, is a deliberate subversion of Journey's End, where Clara does not get her memory wiped, the Doctor gets his memory wiped, and Clara gets to keep the power, gets to keep the knowledge, gets to keep the immortality, and even gets a TARDIS. It's a deliberate inversion on the ending of Journey's End in Series 4. I would legit be interested in what Gary has to say about that, but of course, this video is not about actually discussing the media, it's not actually about critical thinking. No, ironically, for Nerdrotic, it's about the message. It's just his message. Drawing five square miles of London, she does this and then dies. And immediately wakes up again because they undid one of the greatest stories in Doctor Who, for a transmission allegory. Turns out when Donna had a child, she passed down her Metacrisis Time Lord energy to her daughter, making it the most powerful Time Lord of all. A trans lord. Binary. Non-binary. We are binary. She's not. Because the doctors This clip is full of music in the episode. Like I said, props to the editor for managing to get a clean edit on this. And neither. And more. And if that wasn't enough, they brought David Tennant back so he doesn't have a criticism. He, he's just playing it and being like, look how terrible this is. And you, you're kind of going to have to explain yourself here, Gary. 60th anniversary special, which really didn't celebrate the show at all, to dress him down. We know everything. Thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. Because she'd have understood. Shut up. Just shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut it up. 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 And just like that, your one yeah. opportunity to. Th th there's, there's nothing here. He doesn't have. A, he doesn't have a criticism. God, considering the amount of people that we're going to be watching over the course of this video who are going to cite the same moments as a point of contention, the actual amount of arguments, the actual amount of criticisms that we're hearing about them is like non-existent. The fact that there are zero arguments just implies that the existence of a trans person, the existence of black people, the existence of disabled people in and of itself is the issue, which given all available evidence, seems to be the genuine position that Gary holds. Coming off reviewing the Marvels, I didn't think anything could get any worse, especially this, and I'm a sweet summer child because boy was I wrong. While the Marvels was just a shitty movie, the Doctor Who 60th anniversary used nostalgia bait to beat you over the head over and over again with propaganda. Don't believe me? Well, I over beat you over and over again, he shows one moment in one scene. Even he has to know, even the editor has to know as well, that like, this is such a flimsy point. This is such a flimsy hill to die on. Oh, and also, the comparison with the Marvels as well, that is part of the grift. That is part of the hate cycle. You thought this was bad, it's gonna get worse. You thought Doctor Who was bad, the next thing that I'm gonna complain about for money is gonna be even worse. You know, it can never be peaks and valleys. It always has to be a constant downward trend because that's how you radicalize people. You have to keep your audience in a perpetual state of anger. You have to keep them in a perpetual state of victimhood. I guess I guarantee you, sometime over the next maybe two or three months, there is going to be, oh, you thought that Yasmin Finney and David Tennant were bad in the 60th anniversary specials. Wait till you see what Shooty Gat was said. I guarantee you that's going to happen because these people are so fucking predictable. The Doctor Who 60th anniversary used nostalgia bait to beat you over the head over and over again with propaganda. Don't believe me? Well, over the next- No, I don't believe you. <laughs> I mean, you've not demonstrated any sort of critical thought or critical thinking in this video, and you've lied on numerous occasions. I, I don't believe you. This week, the usual suspects in the access media will be running with a lot of articles like this. Doctor Who's first 60th anniversary special is the Turf's Worth Nightmare. If you had removed all- Like, once again, this is just perpetuating the victimhood mentality. This is just the persecution complex at work. 
in lieu of presenting any actual arguments, in lieu of presenting anything actually wrong with the episode itself, you have to demonstrate an us versus them mentality. Oh, the access media, the mainstream media and stuff, they're saying that you're gonna hate it. They say that they love it. it you know, once again, it, it's part of the cycle. Gary is honestly pretty good at being a propagandist for his own message. You have to define yourself by the opposition. You have to define yourself by the things that you hate, which once again, is not a healthy approach. Genuinely, it's not. Anniversary special is the Turf's Worth Nightmare. If you had removed all the agenda from this 60th anniversary special... Like, it he's not named any sort of agenda. Like, he genuinely hasn't named anything. It just seems that in this context, the agenda is just the existence of queer people and a disabled woman. Like, that's it. It still would have only been a mediocre episode for a middle of a season, but ultimately... So you, you could have focused on that, or at least, at the very fucking least, used that to bolster your argument, but you just didn't have anything. Failure of this show lays at the very large feet of our new Rose. Won't you go home? Uh, so the failure of the episode is just because there was a trans woman in it. Like, he's, he's just fucking said it. A character like Captain Jack Harkness worked for the same reasons the new Rose didn't. One character was much more than his sexuality and the other one was- uh, I'm actually not that sure. At least like this is not the hill that you want to die on. This is not the argument that you want to make, at least in this context. Jack was heavily defined by his pansexuality. The story is called The Doctor Dances, AKA an allegory for sex. For crying out loud, in this shot, the Doctor and Jack are literally fighting over a banana. Captain Jack is introduced in The Empty Child, looking at Rose's ass, and then turns around and compliments the ass of the gentleman next to him. That is way more overt, that is way less subtle than anything done in The Star Beast. But once again, things before, pick your year, 2014, 2015, that was fine. Anything after that is woke and preaching to the message or whatever. So predictable. And the other one wasn't more than its identity. I really didn't think the special would be that bad, but once I heard that the showrunner Russell T. Davies wanted to avoid associating disability with evil and change Davros completely, I guess I should have known. On that- Didn't change him completely, that's just the canonical prequel state of Davros as established for the past 50 years. Like, come on man, you, you, come on, you've got to know that this is a stupid point to make, right? He, he has to know this, right? I mean, he called Doctor Who one of the greatest shows in the world, surely he knows like the basic information about one of its main villains. I guess I should have known. On that note, hashtag I stand, I'm sorry, I sit with Davros. Like genuinely, the fake indignation, the unironic virtue signaling trying to support a disabled character for disabled representation, when even in the course of this video, he himself said that the best form of representation was either at best sci-fi abstraction or just no representation at all. The fucking duplicitous nature. You don't even want disabled people in media. You acted visibly disturbed and upset and shaken when Nadia Albina was in the Halloween apocalypse, and you're here trying to claim that you sit with Davros? You don't even think disabled people should be on TV. Davros. At this point, we shouldn't be surprised, but it doesn't make it any less disappointing. First, there was Disney Star Wars, then Disney Marvel, now there's Disney Doctor Who. Ugh. I think what sums up the first episode- I, like I said, He's just not naming anything. I, like, like I said, he's letting the audience do all of the legwork here, because he's not saying anything. The, like, he had one prescriptive statement, and it was that disabled people shouldn't be in media. ...of the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who is the last two paragraphs of a review from the BBC. If you've been indifferent to Who, this won't be the episode to convert you. And if you're altogether new to the show, you'll probably wonder what all the fuss is about. And although the show has always been progressive, look at the number of stories over the decades about... For uh, why did he say progressive like that? Like, like, this is objectively true, and this is meant to be a review that Gary is citing positively? Did he just, like, not read the thing? And he, like, did he, did he just not read it? Does he think that this progressive stuff that the show has always done, like, is a bad thing? AKA, what he was calling earlier, the best show ever, has been doing stuff wrong for 60 years? Like, this is so muddled. I think partly because Gary doesn't actually believe in anything, because he just has absolutely no principles, other than, you know, I want to platform all the Nazis and be best friends with them. For example, threats to the environment. This special is preachy, and by the end, little more than a delivery system for the message. If you like what you heard, please like, like share. Like at this point, it's just a dog whistle. At this point, like th there's there's nothing here. Like th this whole video, there's nothing here.
Like I said, I'll give props to the editing of the video, but honestly, that was kind of it. This was an absolute nothing burger. Speaking of people who have open contempt for black people, geeks and gamers who genuinely, my very first exposure to them was them <laughs> hating the idea of Ava DuVernay directing a Star Wars movie because he doesn't think that black people should be able to direct movies. That was my introduction to geeks and gamers a couple of years ago. You'll probably know him as the guy who could not hold in his racism and used a slur in his review of Prey. So weak-willed, so unable to hide his obvious bigotry. Anyway, Doctor Who disaster, this is peak wokeness. I know enough to realize when something bad is out there. And when you see this kind of trending hashtag, it's probably not a good sign. We know it's like the 60th anniversary for Dr. I who mean, the fact that, you know, it's Gary who was, uh, who was tweeting this, who was sharing this hashtag, and he couldn't even come up with any sort of reasons. It kind of shows that this is a bit of a nothing burger, that it's an artificial trend. The anniversary for Dr. Who, they're doing these three special releases, and one of them featured David Tennant, who's... I, I don't listen. I don't know anything about Doctor Who, but I do know that people love David Tennant's Doc. I don't really know who this guy is. I know that he said a load of racist stuff on Nerd Rotic's review of Blue Beetle, but I don't really know who he is. And he gets a lot of love and a lot of respect. And they were bringing him back, and apparently it was all to just shit all over him and uh, continue to make sure you understand. Just because of the one line, male presenting Time Lord, like one line in a sixty-minute special is shitting all over David Tennant. Come on, mate, have some perspective. God's sake, it's the fucking victim complex. He's the he's the living meme of the person who puts up all of those cardboard cutouts of the monsters and cowers in the corner because he like, he's not comfortable unless he's feeling incredibly victimized by his own design. What a weak person. I know we're only thirty seconds in, but God, the cowardice is just oozing from the screen right now that the female doctor is the best ever like jesus christ you see this person in real life you just blow on him and he just crumbles he just falls away he's so paper thin he's so thin skinned doctor is the best ever jed explain this clip i'm gonna play it explain what this means and why they uh disrespect david Tennant like this hello just passing by because i got a bit lost it's funny 60 minutes ago i was this really brilliant woman and I've got this little face back again. I mean, why? Well, there's a lot going on in this clip here. So this isn't actually from the 60th anniversary. It's from a few minute long children. Need it's, like, it's just a fun introductory line reminding the audience that, yes, I was Jodie Whittaker. Now I'm David Tennant again, because the audience, the mainstream audience watching Children in Need aren't really going to know what's going on. So it's there to reinforce that this is a mystery. This is an ongoing plot arc. We know that Shooty Gat was waiting in the rings, but we're doing a few specials with Tennant and it's part of the mystery. So that's kind of it. The fact that they're reading this much into it like i said these guys are just absolutely thin-skinned charity special that came out about a week or two ago that showed him going back to the origin of the creation of his biggest villains it's it's basically the equivalent of a time traveler going back to meet baby hitler that's basically what this scene is and then all it does is campy music and say oh it's this brilliant woman she'd probably be able to handle the situation better and it was all done so that the that's not at all what it's implied you <laughs> So not only is he lying, he's lying to make himself look so weak. This is a lie that makes him look worse by just the virtue of the lie itself. This is genuinely the artistic equivalent of going on camera and saying, oh, I have a tiny dick. I, that, that, that's what this guy's doing to himself. My God. The creator of the Daleks, the, the Hitler in this situation, could be taken out of his wheelchair that he was in for most of his life because being in a wheelchair is offensive. It associates disability with evil. No, that's not what's been said at all. We've covered this before, but like I said, this is a Davros prequel. And they're changing Jeez. the canon, so he was- And here's the thing though, is that this guy, these two probably have no idea what's going on, like understandably, and this guy is just like lying to them and then they're getting upset at the lie that he's propagating. I'm so glad that the camera is set up like this. This is a fucking human centipede. This is the guy at the front who is eating Doctor Who, the Destination Skyro Children in the episode. And then he shits out a lie. This guy eats the shitty lie, then shits that into Geeks and Gamers' mouth and it becomes a human centipede. This is how this works. This is how misinformation propagates in these reactionary circles. Never in his wheelchair. He's not just in his wheelchair. It's a life support system. It's used to artificially extend his life from a normal human lifespan to thousands of years. So we saw- And it's also a wheelchair because he can't walk. Decrepit, his skin's decayed, his eyes don't work, but now he just looks like an SS soldier. Because it's a prequel, that's how Davros started. 
in a, a uniform, and that's what he's always been now, according to Russell T. Davies. So there's a lot going on. No, that's not how he's always... No, that's not what he said. Like I said, just open fucking lies. I, this guy, I don't think, has said a single honest thing during the entire time that he's been talking. Like, this guy lies as easy as he fucking breathes. Going on in just that few minute charity special that this clip's from. And then... Uh, what we really need in Doctor Who is a lesson on pronouns. I don't think I've ever cringed harder at a scene in anything that I cringed at this right here. I mean, I cringed pretty hard here, but I actually cringed harder at the next one we're going to show. So mm -hmm. we'll I haven't seen that we'll next one. Like, they've already given the Game Boy. It's just the exact same clips. It's the exact same talking points. They, the fact that they are just regurgitating the exact same arguments. They've got the exact same complaints at the exact same perfectly reasonable scenes. Like, it's absolutely madness they're sheep they are fucking sheep they just follow each other they don't have any sort of individuality they don't have any sort of independent thought they're fucking sheep till so the worst of the worst <laughs> okay um it is what we really need is a lesson in pronouns and assuming people's pronouns by the way from a fucking trans person yes mm -hmm. i promise I can. Like, <laughs> blimey do you, do you want to hold your open contempt for queer people fuck's sake so this clip doesn't actually show it but in a second, he says, I understand that because it's the same for me. Canonizing that the doctor's pronouns are not he, she, they, or whatnot. They are a definite article as well. Like Yeah, because they go for a title. The title of the doctor. The doctor is a gender neutral term. Like, the, they can't come up with anything bad about this. They're trying so hard. We've watched so many videos and so many people reacting to the same lines, the same clips, and the fact that the fucking nothing's coming out the other end. Genuinely, their positions, their stances, their ideology, so weak. <laughs> it's so fucking stupid. So this actor is trans <laughs> and... They are playing a trans character in universe as well, correct? Yes, yeah, it's both trans. And <laughs> it, it doesn't come across in the episode because of appearance, but this is a 15-year-old character. And yeah. it hangs out with other... Re yeah, they look pretty young. Okay. real life 15-year-old and acts like they're blending in. But this a actor, Yasmin, is about a foot and a half taller than all the other 15-year-olds that are interacted with oh, she doesn't interact with other 15 year olds like he, he's just fucking lying all the time she, like th she doesn't interact with other 15 year olds at least in close proximity like there's a young kid in the alleyway who is definitely not 15 who's probably like maybe 10 or 11 years old like just fucking lying all the time stands out like a sore thumb okay so so explain to me that knows nothing about how bad of shape is doctor who and compared to star wars and marvel yes oh, so trust the guy who has literally not said a single true statement for the past three minutes yeah i'm gonna ask this guy what the current state of doctor who is it is in worse shape Which than works. them all it, it's not even it's not even close so, yes, a Doctor Who has always dealt with social issues, like classic Star Trek. If you've seen classic Star Trek, there's always... It's even dealt with gender-neutral pronouns and, you know, the removal of the gender binary for aliens. And a little bit of stuff like that, but this has taken it way too far and... Way too far? You played a 20-second clip in a one-hour episode. Get a fucking grip. This episode is the wokest thing I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of woke stuff working with you guys and being in this sphere for a while. Well, if this is what I was saying with Nerdrotic. They can't just have peaks and valleys. It's a further descent all the time, descending further down, 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 down. It's part of the radicalization and it's part of the con. It's a very deliberate strategy. They cannot relent. They cannot give an inch because they're worried that, in this case, trans people will take a mile. The overcompensation in this case is partly because they know they don't have anything. They know they don't really have any complaints or an actual leg to stand on here because if they did out of all of these videos they'd have something to mention they'd have an argument they'd have an actual criticism they'd have critical thinking it's just not here it's vapid if captain marvel the first one's like a six or a seven this episode was a 25 like it Jeez. far and away blew away no. any competition because this clip doesn't actually show the worst in the episode. This one you're about to show, it is not the worst in the episode. It canonizes that in this universe, being non-binary and trans is a literal superpower that saves the city of London. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yes, we know. We know everything. Right. And you know everything. We know everything and you know nothing. Wow. 
a shame you're not a woman anymore. I mean, to be fair, you actually don't know anything as evidenced over the course of these five minutes. You have all that. And also, being trans in the story is not a superpower because Donna is cis and also has the power. The guy who did this is kind of the equivalent of George Lucas. So imagine after the sequel trilogy, George Lucas comes back. God, can you actually have a conversation without framing it in the fucking context of Star Wars? <laughs> like, come on. Go outside. Touch grass. And he makes a Luke Skywalker solo film where he just berates Luke Skywalker the entire time, says he's pathetic. If only you had been a woman, you would... It's really interesting when these grifters can only frame the conversations through the most extreme hypotheticals, like this hypothetical of this, uh, of this Skywalker solo series. Their arguments are so empty, their points are so flimsy, that they have to resort to this, like, imaginary Mott and Bailey. Not an actual Mott and Bailey, like an imaginary Mott and Bailey. It's a fallacy but somehow even more pathetic. To save the day, you're like, oh, finally, we've got Doctor Who back. The guy who brought it back in 2005 can come save it, make it great again after the terrible sequel trilogy or the Jodie Whittaker era in this case, and he does so much worse than the sequel trilogies could have dreamed of. You've played, like, 40 seconds from an hour-long episode. Come on. And not only that, but he's, like, also, like, shitting on fans and Instagram mm -hmm. comments and stuff like that, arguing back. Yeah. And yeah, supposed fans who, if they had their way, Rusty Davis would be in prison because he's queer. Like, it's so funny to see this, like, fake indignation on social media all the time. Like, people who go on Rusty Davis' Instagram and be like, I think you're a groomer. I think you've ruined TV. I think you should get rid of all the queer people. And he's like, fuck off, and then blocks them. And they're like, he's so unreasonable reasonable to the fans he's insulting the fans like i see this all the fucking time like i didn't think he'd save the day but there were a lot of people who had hope for the first time in doctor who in five years and he did this canonizing non-binary is a superpower the, the line was we needed someone who was male nor female but neither and both and so much more be non-binary is more than human holy crap <laughs> That's not even the quote. He's just fucking made up that quote. And you you can see the look on his face that he knows he's making this up. He knows he's bullshitting. Male nor female, but neither and both and so much more. Be non-binary is more than human. He's lying and he fucking knows it. If there's any fans of these individuals who are still watching this video, firstly, thank you so much. You need to understand, they are actively, deliberately lying to you, time and time again, constantly. And you need to ask, why are you putting up with that? Why are you letting somebody lie to you so explicitly? We saw this set up earlier, this very fitting human centipede allegory right here in front of our screens. But if you are a regular viewer or a subscriber or a supporter of these people, then you are one of these back people on the human centipede. You are one of the people who are actively gobbling the shit. It's honestly the best comparison. They are taking advantage of you. They are shitting in your mouth and telling you it's chocolate. Just to further hit home the point, if you're watching this, you've likely seen the episode, so you know that he's lying, but just to further hit home the point, more than human. The phrase more than human doesn't even appear in the episode. He's lying so explicitly that it's genuinely insulting to watch. He is insulting geeks and gamers and this other person in this live stream. He's lying to their faces, shitting in their mouths and telling them that it's chocolate. He's insulting them. Obviously, geeks and gamers is a terrible person who does not even think that black people should be in media, but I sincerely hope that he realizes that this person just went on his platform, went on his live stream, and actively insulted him and his entire audience. I don't know who this guy is. His name's not in the description description, but blimey, I, I do sincerely hope that Geeks and Gamers and this individual here as well, like, become aware that they've just been fucking insulted. The third one's gonna have Neil Patrick Harris playing the uh, toy maker, which is a villain from the first Doctor back in the black and white days, and it's it's just gonna be super gay between him and David Tennant, and <sighs> so the... the it's just so out in the open. It's just so obvious that these people just hate queer people. It's just so obvious that like, it, they say it themselves. There's no need for euphemisms. There's no need for dog whistling. They're just like, yeah, queer people, black people, disabled people shouldn't be in media. Get rid of them. Like, okay, I went into this expecting, like, Geeks and Gamers himself to be just saying the most abhorrent stuff. Like, I've not pre-watched any of this, but, oh, God. Like, we've got a brand new main antagonist, everybody. Just this absolute piece of work. 
Okay, just for fun and because we've not properly gone over him before, let's talk about heel versus babyface. Now, you folks may know him as the guy who went on the Starfield unhinged pronouns rant. Like, you'll probably know him from that. Incidentally, have you folks actually seen what he was reacting and responding to during that viral rant? At first, I thought it was over like a pronoun selector or a gender selector in an RPG game. I mean, that's what I thought it was at first. He's obsessed with pronouns and current deism and stuff like that. But no, if you actually watch the full rant, he's getting angry and furious and livid over a cis woman talking to him in the game. But yeah, you folks will remember him from that. I personally remember him when he was responding to conservative MP Nick Fletcher standing up on International Men's Day and saying that women in TV was causing an increase in crime amongst young boys, but specifically an increase in stabbings. Heel vs Babyface took that and not only said, no, Nick Fletcher never said that, mainstream media is lying, mainstream media is lying, even though we all saw him say it. But also, if he did say it, he would have been completely right. He would have been absolutely right to say that. Gen Genuine psychopathy, genuine doublethink. No, he didn't say it, but if he did say it, he was absolutely right. So what does a female doctor causes stabbings in the UK have to say about Doctor Who slash whom? Absolute disaster, a ratings and audience failure. Doctor Who is back. David Tennant once again takes the role of the Time Lord, the Doctor, and nobody cared. Honestly, that was actually probably the most intelligent thing I've heard him say. However, the first of the three specials has not gone down very well with the most important thing, audiences. And I can't for the life of me understand why. Yes, the me. I promise I can help him get home and then you'll never see me again. You're assuming he as a pronoun. I know this is science. God, they're saying the exact same shit. There's not an original thought in that brain of his. It's fiction, but we're actually going to pretend that that's a good... <laughs> Are you, he, or she, or they? My chosen pronoun is the definite article. I am always the me. Ah, as a wise man once said. Fucking pronouns! The return of Russell T. Davis as the showrunner of the series gave some fans a modicum of hope that things could change. However, Russell T. Davis decided to quash that pretty damn quickly with his own politics and also his stance on the timeless children. God, Russell T. Davis inserting his own politics into the media that he makes. Surely the writer of It's a Sin, years and years, queer as folk. Surely, <laughs> surely this is unprecedented for him. Saying that it remains canon. But then came Davros. And there's a problem with the Davros of old in that uh, he's a wheelchair user who is evil. Oh, okay. Right. Just for context, Heel vs. Babyface, this is the guy who was on the Nerdrotic livestream where he expressed visible anger, upset, and discomfort over Nadia Albina being in Doctor Who the Halloween Apocalypse. So this guy also does not think that disabled people should be in media. And he's once again going to act indignant because he doesn't actually fucking believe what he's saying because these people are obvious liars. So, also it's not a wheelchair, it's a life support system. It's described as a wheelchair in the show, it's described as a wheelchair in the script. Davros cannot walk, he uses the chair to get around it is a wheelchair you're being pedantic but don't worry about it i had problems with that and a lot of us on the production team had the problems with that that sounds like a you problem not a we problem associating disability with evil and trust me there's a very long tradition of this there's also a very long history of depicting disabled people as heroic and powerful and strong and not allowing their disability to define them and to overcome it and be the hero once again this guy does not think that disabled people should be represented in tv so for him to act indignant like this comes, comes it just comes across as pretty fucking ghoulish but playing devil's advocate here yes there is this trend but it is massively vastly outnumbered by the negative stereotypes and the negative representation He's put five characters on screen, the majority of which are comic book characters. And yeah, that's important to have that representation in comic books, but it can't just exclusively be in comic books. Yeah, you can fill a screen here with positive representation, but you can also fill an entire tome full of the negative representation. Like, this is just, like, beyond dispute. Come it and be the hero that they know they can be. But I guess that didn't matter. It seemed Russell T. Davis had a very specific idea about how he wanted to portray disabled people. Evening, boys. My bad. Why didn't I think of that? Now kids can happily walk down the street thinking that somebody in a wheelchair is going to blow them up. That's sure to... 
it's beyond parody. It's genuinely beyond parody. He's talking about disabled characters, disabled representation, not letting it define them and also being the heroes they know they can be. And then we have an actual example and he's not fucking happy about it. Like, <laughs> it's honestly beyond parody. And the fact that this not only takes place in the same video, but within like the span of 30 seconds is genuinely insane to me. And also, isn't this like the same sort of philosophy that's defined Doctor Who? Like, oh, any police box in the 1960s, it's from 60 years ago, any police box could be a gateway to another world. Any statue could be alive. Any ticking clock could be hiding a clockwork android. Supernatural and super extraordinary things in plain sight is kind of Doctor Who modus operandi. But no, sorry, I forget, we're dealing with someone who is genuinely intellectually challenged. But don't worry, Doctor Who's a massive success. As we can see from this wonderful headline. God, it's the same one that Nerdrotic brought in. In fact, yeah, this is Nerdrotic's tweet. Like, they just take notes from each other. It is a fucking human centipede. First 60th anniversary special is a turf's worst nightmare. Because that doesn't scream of ideology above entertainment at all, does it? To be fair, you are demonstrating nothing but ideology here. It. it must be a glitch in the system. I'm pretty sure that 60 years of history will be treated with the utmost of respect. Yeah, of course, I'm talking absolute shite. They shat all over the doctor. Yes, we know. We know everything. Same clip, and same you know bit. One light-hearted jab from one mate to another. Donna is the doctor's best friend. And these guys are absolutely shitting themselves. We know everything. You know nothing. That's a really good start with, you know, the star of your show for 60 fucking years. Do not show these people, Clara. Do not show these people River Song. They won't be able to hack it. Shame you're not a woman anymore. Because, of course, having a vagina... No offense, love. Having a vagina just makes you incredibly correct all the time, it seems. No offense, mate. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but doesn't it seem strange that every single person who has had an issue with this scene also fucking hates trans people? I wonder if there's some weird common denominator here. I wonder if there is some uh, consistent trend that is underlying all of these videos. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. Yeah, by the way, I haven't edited this or doctored it in any way. This is actually what happened in the special. R.I.P. Doctor Who. <laughs> By the way, I, he's not even going to name an actual argument. He's not even going to say what the issue is. Any chance of you getting some fucking acting lessons? Jeez. Here's Mammology 101 quoting one of the stunning and brave lines from the special. I was this really brilliant woman. Come on now, there's no need to lie. And now I've got this old face back again. The hate towards white males was overboard in God, this... I, once again, victim complex. I know that this is becoming repetitive, but I'm only working with what they're giving me. Just pure victim complex. Just a pure humiliation fetish. This guy has an absolute kink for being humiliated. Thousand percent. I would bet my life on it. Also, Speaking of kink, you might recognize Hill vs. Babyface as the guy who quite routinely starts lusting over women in media only to be told that they're a trans woman and then he just acts all indignant. This guy, oh, he's, he's infamous for it. Special R.I.P. Doctor Who. But thankfully, one of the new Doctor Who audience that the BBC are so desperate to hold on to responded to it by saying, I hate cis men. Y'all are the most towering species in the world. Cis, of course, is a hideous slur. The word that you're looking for. Cis is a hideous slur, you, f you absolute worm. Oh my god. Cis is a term that's been around for over a century that means the other side of. Like, god. Looking for is normal. But as Mammology yep, says- sorry. If you're queer, you are not normal. Like I said, they don't even hide the bigotry. This guy who has shown open contempt for queer and disabled people, I wonder if he's got an issue with the episode with a queer and disabled person in it based on his own ideology. Hmm, I wonder if that's the common factor here. These guys go on and on and on about Doctor Who pushing an agenda, pushing the message, but this is all that they're doing. The calls are coming from inside the house. Himself, this is the audience that you wanted enjoy another wonderful doctor who fan responds to the same comment by saying i pray day and night for doctor who to introduce actual hate towards white males wow <laughs> this is a wonderful audience it really really <laughs> that's a pretty banger tweet but also 
I would take 1,000 of these over a single scumbag like Heel vs. Babyface in terms of an audience representation. Any day of the week. These guys would just be annoying online. These guys might shoot up a school. I mean, there's no wonder that the guy who broke into Nancy Pelosi's house to try and assassinate her but wound up hitting her husband with a hammer was found to be a fandom menace nerd erotic viewer. Genuinely, these guys will be passive aggressive on Twitter. These guys will commit terrorism. And that's not even a joke. That's just a demonstrable fact. Remember, this guy's viral Starfield rant was because a cis woman was in the game. Because you're no longer getting an audience based off entertainment. You're getting an audience based off your ideology. And therefore, it can be nothing but... And that's his subscriber base. That's his viewer base. He's just too dumb to realize it. Visive. Congratulations. Running off what could possibly be the last remaining actual fans of the series. Uh, I'm only kidding. They left ages ago. But clearly, I'm a white supreme or something. So let's head over to Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, my goodness, you are the absolute worst example of a white supreme. Genuinely, Heel vs. Babyface is an absolute gift to anti-racist advocacy. You've got Nazis claiming that white people are genetically superior and the white people are just naturally supreme and the smartest race. But then we've got Heels vs. Babyface here offering the perfect counterexample. It's fucking great. See what they think of the episode. It stands at a a staggering 100% with every single solitary one of those nine critics that actually reviewed it. And let's just be real here. Yeah, okay, fuck's sake. We've gone over this before. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Rotten Tomatoes is not really a good website for collating TV reviews. Like, even some of the most highest profile shows only get like a dozen reviews. Like, this is just not a good metric on any sort of grounds. Not just the audience score, but even the critics one. Like, th this is just not a good metric in any respect. Only 250 odd people from the actual audience decided to drop it a review. And even I mean, 250 reviews and like 5 million people watched it in the UK alone. And it was one of the most watched things on Disney Plus over the weekend when it dropped worldwide, charting in the top four in every single country without fail, with an average ranking of like two and a half. Blimey, it's almost as if a audience metric that is easily abusable is just not a useful barometer. It barely scraped over 50% in terms of whether or not they liked it. That's funny. Put in divisive stuff and you divide people. Who would have thunk it? And you've not even made a case for why the supposedly divisive stuff is even bad. You've not even like made the case for it. Hey, let's get back to that wonderful Doctor Who audience that the BBC so desperately wanted, shall we? Doctor Who is getting review God, bombed. You, God, you can tell that he's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Like, all of the people that I've been talking about over the course of this video are pretty big names who have got hundreds and thousands of subscribers and hundreds of thousands of viewers. But this guy's like, God, I, I need content. I need something. Let me just literally just scrape the bottom of Twitter. If you have to work this hard, if you have to search this far and dig this deep, you, you kind of already know that you're on the losing side, mate. On Rotten Tomatoes, audience score is pissing off people who can't handle transmission characters on TV. I'll call that a sign of success. Rotten Tomatoes audience scores are meaningless. Love. What's it? Wait, that can't handle transmission characters on TV? Is this a Bolstrek thing? What? I love this. This is... <laughs> Okay, that's a funny freeze frame. Is this a bolstrek thing where he can't say trans people, otherwise he'll just involuntarily say a slur? That's very possible here. That's the spirit sunshine. Piss off the audience, the people that matter, and it's a success! I mean, you were never gonna like it in the first place. Like, <laughs> you got angry at a disabled woman being in the TV show. Doctor Who is not for you, and it probably never has been for you. So how did it do in the ratings? Well, it brought in an absolutely paltry 5.08 million on the overnights. Barely a million above Jodie Whittaker's last performance. And Jodie Whittaker was posting some of the worst ratings of Doctor Who history. Okay, so yeah, this is where we get to the point where these guys will just actively lie to you. Um, so the number itself, yes, that is correct, 5.08 million. But the overnight broadcast of Doctor Who The Star Beast was the biggest drama launch of the year so far. And it was either the second or third most watched program of the week. Which means in terms of the audience ranking, the audience rating, this is the highest that Doctor Who has charted since 2018. And in an era of on-demand, in an era of streaming and things, 
things like that and catch up, it means that this seven day figure is going to be way more representative of the audience size. We even have some of the data from the audience share. One second. So the audience share for the Star Beast was 36.5%. That's the percentage of people who are watching BBC One when the Star Beast was broadcast compared to other channels. 36.5%. That is the highest audience share since the Ghost Monument. It's a higher audience share than the entire Peter Capaldi era with the exception of his first story, Deep Breath. This is actually the first time I've seen this statistic, this specific one for the Star Beast. This is a really good audience share. If we go to the end of the David Tennant era, 36.5%, so it's done better in terms of audience share than the Waters of Mars. Stories like The Next Doctor, The End of Time Part 1, The End of Time Part 2, those are regeneration stories and also broadcast on Christmas. So that's slightly skewed, but we're looking at like peak Doctor Who level figures here, similar to like the Poison Sky, Sontarum Stratagem, the Fires of Pompeii, Utopia, Blink, etc. We're in this ballpark. So yeah, the highest overnight figure since Resolution, New Year's Day 2019, the highest audience share since 2018 with the Ghost Monument. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good result. And of course, David Tennant was posting some of the highest ratings of Doctor Who's history at his peak. So it looked- And in terms of the audience share, He's kind of recaptured that. Looks like the audience, well, they don't give a shit anymore. But that's what happens. Biggest drama launch of 2023. Here's something that Heel vs. Babyface I don't think we'll be able to understand. So people knew up front that Yasmin Finney was going to be in the episode playing a trans person. They knew up front that the story starred queer icon Miriam Margulies. They knew that there would be a disabled actor in it. They knew that Russell T. Davis is as anti-conservative as they come, often giving incredibly viral speeches at award ceremonies. And they thought, you know what? Yeah. Let's tune in and give it the biggest launch of 2023 so far, but Heels vs. Babyface cannot fucking fathom in that tiny little brain of his that there are some people out there who look at that writing on the wall, who look at those elements and think, yeah, let's give it a go. When apathy sets in, this is what happens when you take something that is genuinely for everybody and then make and okay and also once again just plain devil's advocate here let's say that this 5.08 million was actually objectively a terrible score he's doing a terrible job at presenting that evidence or presenting that argument what other dramas have there been this year what other overnight figures have there been in its proximity you know this 5.08 million figure means literally nothing on its own less than nothing on its own but let's face it he knows that that's part of the point that's part of the lie make it for a very specific group while proclaiming it's for all it's not for all it's not for virtually anyone anymore it's for you your little club and your little weirdo mates and that's it but there is one more very important question to ask and that is as What's your review of the show? Well, that's simple. You couldn't pay me to watch this shit anymore. I'll see you in the next video. You take care. So yeah, this guy hasn't even watched the episode. He's just gotten mad at regurgitated things online. God say, what a fucking cook. Like genuinely, this is cuckoldry. This guy is absolutely into cuckoldry. Thousand percent. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me on this ride. It's... <laughs> We've learned so much and we've grown together so much. I hope that you've uh, you found this as illuminating experience as I did. I'll see you folks next time.